Section 18 of The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in May 2016. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 10 Hatred and Anger hatred rage effects off on the system uncovering of the teeth rage in the insane anger and indignation as expressed by the various races of man sneering and defiance the uncovering of the canine tooth on one side of the face if we have suffered or expect to suffer some willful injury from a man or if he is in any way offensive to us, we dislike him, and dislike easily rises into hatred. Such feelings, if experienced in a moderate degree, are not clearly expressed by any movement of the body or features, excepting perhaps by a certain gravity of behaviour or by some ill temper. Few individuals, however, can long reflect about a hated person without feeling and exhibiting signs of indignation or rage. But if the offending person be quite insignificant, we experience merely disdain or contempt. If, on the other hand, he is all-powerful, then hatred passes into terror, as when a slave thinks about a cruel master, or a savage about a bloodthirsty malignant deity. Most of our emotions are so closely connected with their expression that they hardly exist if the body remains passive, the nature of the expression depending in chief part on the nature of the actions which have been habitually performed under this particular state of the mind. A man, for instance, may know that his life is in the extremest peril and may strongly desire to save it, yet, as Louis XVI said when surrounded by a fierce mob, am I afraid? Feel my pulse. So a man may intensely hate another, but until his bodily frame is affected, he cannot be said to be enraged. Rage. I have already had occasion to treat of this emotion in the third chapter when discussing the direct influence of the excited sensorium on the body in combination with the effects of habitually associated actions. Rage exhibits itself in the most diversified manner. The heart and circulation are always affected. The face reddens or becomes purple, with the veins on the forehead and neck distended. The reddening of the skin has been observed with the copper-coloured Indians of South America, and even, as it is said, on the white cicatrices left by old wounds on Negroes. Monkeys also redden from passion. With one of my own infants, under four months old, I repeatedly observed that the first symptom of an approaching passion was the rushing of the blood into his bare scalp. On the other hand, the action of the heart is sometimes so much impeded by great rage that the countenance becomes pallid or livid, and not a few men with heart disease have dropped down dead under this powerful emotion. The respiration is likewise affected, the chest heaves and the dilated nostrils quiver. As Tennyson writes, sharp breaths of anger puffed her fairy nostrils out hence we have such expressions as breathing out vengeance and fuming with anger the excited brain gives strength to the muscles and at the same time energy to the will the body is commonly held erect ready for instant action but sometimes it is bent forward towards the offending person with the limbs more or less rigid the mouth is generally closed with firmness, showing fixed determination, and the teeth are clenched or ground together. Such gestures as the rising of the arms with the fists clenched, as if to strike the offender, are common. Few men in a great passion, and telling someone to be gone, can resist acting as if they intended to strike or push the man violently away. The desire, indeed, to strike often becomes so intolerably strong that inanimate objects are struck or dashed to the ground, but the gestures frequently become altogether purposeless or frantic. Young children, when in a violent rage, roll on the ground on their backs or bellies, 
screaming, kicking, scratching, or biting everything within reach. So it is, as I hear from Mr. Scott, with Hindu children, and, as we have seen, with the young of the anthropomorphous apes. But the muscular system is often affected in a wholly different way, for trembling is a frequent consequence of extreme rage. The paralyzed lips then refuse to obey the will, and the voice sticks in the throat, or it is rendered loud, harsh, and discordant. If there be much and rapid speaking, the mouth froths. The hair sometimes bristles, but I shall return to this subject in another chapter, when I treat of the mingled emotions of rage and terror. There is in most cases a strongly marked frown on the forehead, for this follows from the sense of anything displeasing or difficult, together with concentration of mind. But sometimes the brow, instead of being much contracted and lowered, remains smooth, with the glaring eyes kept widely open. The eyes are always bright, or may, as Homer expresses it, glisten with fire. They are sometimes bloodshot, and are said to protrude from their sockets, the result, no doubt, of the head being gorged with blood, as shown by the veins being distended. According to Graciolet, the pupils are always contracted in rage, and I hear from Dr. Crichton Brown that this is the case in the fierce delirium of meningitis, but the movements of the iris under the influence of the different emotions is a very obscure subject. Shakespeare sums up the chief characteristics of rage as follows. Quote, in peace there is nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, then lend the eye a terrible aspect. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to his full height. On, on, you noblest English. End quote. From Henry the Fourth, Act Three, Scene One. The lips are sometimes protruded during rage in a manner the meaning of which I do not understand unless it depends on our descent from some ape-like animal. Instances have been observed not only with Europeans but with the Australians and Hindus. The lips, however, are much more commonly retracted, the grinning or clenched teeth being thus exposed. This has been noticed by almost everyone who has written on expression. The appearance is as if the teeth were uncovered, ready for seizing or tearing an enemy, though there may be no intention of acting in this manner. Mr. Dyson Lacey has seen this grinning expression with the Australians when quarrelling, and so has Gaika with the Kaffirs of South America. Dickens, in speaking of an atrocious murderer who had just been caught and was surrounded by a furious mob, describes the people as jumping up one behind another, snarling with their teeth, and making at him like wild beasts. Everyone who has had much to do with young children must have seen how naturally they take to biting when in a passion. It seems as instinctive in them as in young crocodiles, who snap their little jaws as soon as they emerge from the egg. A grinning expression and the protrusion of the lips appear sometimes to go together. A close observer says that he has seen many instances of intense hatred, which can hardly be distinguished from rage, more or less suppressed, in Orientals, and once in an elderly English woman. In all these cases there was a grin, not a scowl, the lips lengthening, the cheeks settling downwards, the eyes half closed, whilst the brow remained perfectly calm. This retraction of the lips and uncovering of the teeth during paroxysms of rage, as if to bite the offender, is so remarkable, considering how seldom the teeth are used by men in fighting, that I inquired from Dr. J. Crichton Brown whether the habit was common in the insane whose passions are unbridled. He informs me that he has repeatedly observed it both with the insane and idiotic, and has given me the following illustrations. Shortly before receiving my letter, he witnessed an uncontrollable outbreak of anger and delusive jealousy in an insane lady. At first she vituperated her husband, and whilst doing so foamed at the mouth. Next she approached close to him with compressed lips and a virulent set frown. 
Then she drew back her lips, especially the corners of the upper lip, and showed her teeth, at the same time aiming a vicious blow at him. A second case is that of an old soldier, who, when he is requested to conform to the rules of the establishment, gives way to discontent, terminating in fury. He commonly begins by asking Dr. Brown whether he is not ashamed to treat him in such a manner. He then swears and blasphemes, paces tip and down, tosses his arms wildly about, and menaces any one near him. At last, as his exasperation culminates, he rushes up towards Dr. Brown with a peculiar sidelong movement, shaking his doubled fist and threatening destruction. Then his upper lip may be seen to be raised, especially at the corners, so that his huge canine teeth are exhibited. He hisses forth his curses through his set teeth, and his whole expression assumes the character of extreme ferocity. A similar description is applicable to another man, excepting that he generally foams at the mouth and spits, dancing and jumping about in a strange, rapid manner, shrieking out his maledictions in a shrill falsetto voice. Dr. Brown also informs me of the case of an epileptic idiot, incapable of independent movements, and who spends the whole day in playing with some toys, but his temper is morose and easily roused into fierceness. When anyone touches his toys, he slowly raises his head from its habitual downward position and fixes his eyes on the offender with a tardy yet angry scowl. If the annoyance be repeated, he draws back his thick lips and reveals a prominent row of hideous fangs, large canines being especially noticeable, and then makes a quick and cruel clutch with his open hand at the offending person. The rapidity of this clutch, as Dr. Brown remarks, is marvellous in a being ordinarily so torpid that he takes about fifteen seconds, when attracted by any noise, to turn his head from one side to the other. If, when thus incensed, a handkerchief, book, or other article be placed into his hands, he drags it to his mouth and bites it. Mr. Nicholl has likewise described to me two cases of insane patients whose lips are retracted during paroxysms of rage. Dr. Maudsley, after detailing various strange animal-like traits in idiots, asks whether these are not due to the reappearance of primitive instincts, a faint echo from a far distant past, testifying to a kinship which man has almost outgrown. He adds that as every human brain passes, in the course of its development, through the same stages as those occurring in the lower vertebrate animals, and as the brain of an idiot is in an arrested condition, we may presume that it will manifest its most primitive functions, and no higher functions. Dr. Maudsley thinks that the same view may be extended to the brain in its degenerated condition in some insane patients, and asks whence come the savage snarl, the destructive disposition, the obscene language, the wild howl, the offensive habits displayed by some of the insane. Why should a human being, deprived of his reason, ever become so brutal in character, as some do, unless he has the brute nature within him? This question must, as it would appear, be answered in the affirmative. Anger, Indignation these states of the mind differ from rage only in degree, and there is no marked distinction in their characteristic signs. Under moderate anger the action of the heart is a little increased, the colour heightened, and the eyes become bright. The respiration is likewise a little hurried, and as all the muscles serving for this function act in association, the wings of the nostrils are somewhat raised to allow of a free indraught of air, and this is a highly characteristic sign of indignation. The mouth is commonly compressed, and there is almost always a frown on the brow. Instead of the frantic gestures of extreme rage, an indignant man unconsciously throws himself into an attitude ready for attacking or striking his enemy, whom he will perhaps scan from head to foot in defiance. He carries his head erect, with his chest well expanded, and the feet planted firmly on the ground. He holds his arms in various positions, with one or both elbows squared, or with the arms rigidly suspended by his sides. With Europeans the fists are commonly clenched. 
The figures 1 and 2 in plate 6 are fairly good representations of men simulating indignation. As one may see in a mirror, if he will vividly imagine that he has been insulted and demands an explanation in an angry tone of voice, that he suddenly and unconsciously throws himself into some such attitude. Rage, anger and indignation are exhibited in nearly the same manner throughout the world, and the following descriptions may be worth giving as evidence of this, and as illustrations of some of the foregoing remarks. There is, however, an exception with respect to clenching the fists, which seems confined chiefly to the men who fight with their fists. With the Australians, only one of my informants has seen the fist clenched. All agree about the body being held erect, and all, with two exceptions, state that the brows are heavily contracted. Some of them allude to the firmly compressed mouth, the distended nostrils, and flashing eyes. According to the Reverend Mr. Taplin, rage with the Australians is expressed by the lips being protruded, the eyes being widely open, and, in the case of the women, by their dancing about and casting dust into the air. Another observer speaks of the native men, when enraged, throwing their arms wildly about. I have received similar accounts, except as to the clenching of the fists, in regard to the Malays of the Malacca Peninsula, the Abyssinians, and the natives of South Africa. So it is with the Dakota Indians of North America, and, according to Mr. Matthews, they then hold their hands erect, frown, and often stalk away with long strides. Mr. Bridges states that the Fuegians, when enraged, frequently stamp on the ground, walk distractedly about, sometimes cry and grow pale. The Reverend Mr. Stack watched a New Zealand man and woman quarrelling and made the following entry in his notebook. Eyes dilated, body swayed violently backwards and forwards, head inclined forwards, fists clenched, now thrown behind the body, now directed towards each other's faces. Mr. Swinhoe says that my description agrees with what he has seen of the Chinese, excepting that an angry man generally inclines his body towards his antagonist and pointing at him pours forth a volley of abuse. Lastly, with respect to the natives of India, Mr. J. Scott has sent me a full description of their gestures and expression when enraged. The low-caste Bengalese disputed about a loan. At first they were calm, but soon grew furious and poured forth the grossest abuse on each other's relations and progenitors for many generations past. Their gestures were very different from those of Europeans, for though their chests were expanded and shoulders squared, their arms remained rigidly suspended, with the elbows turned inwards and the hands alternately clenched and opened. Their shoulders were often raised high and then again lowered. They looked fiercely at each other from under their lowered and strongly wrinkled brows, and their protruded lips were firmly closed. They approached each other, with hands and necks stretched forwards, and pushed, scratched, and grasped at each other. This protrusion of the head and body seems a common gesture with the enraged, and I have noticed it with degraded English women whilst quarrelling violently in the streets. In such cases, it may be presumed that neither party expects to receive a blow from the other. A Bengalee employed in the botanic gardens was accused, in the presence of Mr. Scott, by the native overseer of having stolen a valuable plant. He listened silently and scornfully to the accusation, his attitude erect, chest expanded, mouth closed, lips protruding, eyes firmly set and penetrating. He then defiantly maintained his innocent, with upraised and clenched hands, his head being now pushed forwards, with the eyes widely open and eyebrows raised. Mr. Scott also watched two mechis in Sikkim, quarrelling about their share of payment. They soon got into a furious passion, and then their bodies became less erect, with their heads pushed forwards. They made grimaces at each other their shoulders were raised, their arms rigidly bent inwards at the elbows, and their hands spasmodically closed, but not properly clenched. They continually approached and retreated from each other, and often raised their arms as if to strike, but their hands were open and no blow was given. 
Mr. Scott made similar observations of the Lepchas, whom he often saw quarrelling, and he noticed that they kept their arms rigid and almost parallel to their bodies, with the hands pushed somewhat backwards and partially closed, but not clenched. Sneering, defiance, uncovering the canine tooth on one side. The expression which I wish here to consider differs but little from that already described, when the lips are retracted and the grinning teeth exposed. The difference consists solely in the upper lip being retracted in such a manner that the canine tooth on one side of the face alone is shown, the face itself being generally a little upturned and half averted from the person causing offence. The other signs of rage are not necessarily present. This expression may occasionally be observed in a person who sneers at or defies another, though there may be no real anger, as when any one is playfully accused of some fault and answers, I scorn the imputation. The expression is not a common one, but I have seen it exhibited with perfect distinctness by a lady who was being quizzed by another person. It was described by Parsons as long ago as 1746, with an engraving showing the uncovered canine on one side. Mr. Raylander, without my having made any allusion to the subject, asked me whether I had ever noticed this expression, as he had been much struck by it. He has photographed for me, plate 4, figure 1, a lady who sometimes unintentionally displays the canine on one side, and who can do so voluntarily with unusual distinctness. The expression of a half-playful sneer graduates into one of great ferocity, when, together with a heavily frowning brow and fierce eye, the canine tooth is exposed. A Bengali boy was accused before Mr. Scott of some misdeed. The delinquent did not dare to give vent to his wrath in words, but it was plainly shown on his countenance, sometimes by a defiant frown, and sometimes by a thoroughly canine snarl. When this was exhibited, the corner of the lip over the eye tooth, which happened in this case to be large and projecting, was raised on the side of his accuser, a strong frown being still retained on the brow. Sir C. Bell states that the actor Cook could express the most determined hate when with the oblique cast of his eyes he drew up the outer part of the upper lip and discovered a sharp angular tooth. The uncovering of the canine tooth is the result of a double movement. The angle or corner of the mouth is drawn a little backwards, and at the same time a muscle which runs parallel to and near the nose draws up the outer part of the upper lip and exposes the canine on this side of the face. The contraction of this muscle makes a distinct furrow on the cheek and produces strong wrinkles under the eye, especially at its inner corner. The action is the same as that of a snarling dog, and a dog, when pretending to fight, often draws up the lip on one side alone, namely that facing his antagonist. Our word sneer is in fact the same as snarl, which was originally snar, the L being merely an element implying continuance of action. I suspect that we see a trace of this same expression in what is called a derisive or a sardonic smile. The lips are then kept joined or almost joined, but one corner of the mouth is retracted on the side towards the derided person, and this drawing back of the corner is part of a true sneer. Although some persons smile more on one side of their face than on the other, it is not easy to understand why in cases of derision the smile, if a real one, should so commonly be confined to one side. I have also on these occasions noticed a slight twitching of the muscle which draws up the outer part of the upper lip, and this movement, if fully carried out, would have uncovered the canine and would have produced a true sneer. Mr. Balmer, an Australian missionary in a remote part of Gippsland, says, in answer to my query about the uncovering of the canine on one side, I find that the natives in snarling at each other speak with the teeth closed, the upper lip drawn to one side, and a general angry expression of face, but they look direct at the person addressed. Three other observers in Australia, one in Abyssinia and one in China, answer my query on this head in the affirmative, 
but as the expression is rare and as they enter into no details i am afraid of implicitly trusting them it is however by no means improbable that this animal-like expression may be more common with savages than with civilized races mr gage is an observer who may be fully trusted and he has observed it on one occasion in a malay in the interior of malacca the rev s o gleany answers we have observed this expression with the natives of ceylon but not often lastly in north america dr rothrock has seen it with some wild indians and often in a tribe adjoining the atnas although the upper lip is certainly sometimes raised on one side alone in sneering at or defying any one i do not know that this is always the case for the face is commonly half averted and the expression is often momentary the movement being confined to one side may not be an essential part of the expression but may depend on the proper muscles being incapable of movement excepting on one side i asked four persons to endeavour to act voluntarily in this manner two could expose the canine only on the left side one only on the right side and the fourth on neither side nevertheless it is by no means certain that these same persons if defying any one in earnest would not unconsciously have uncovered their canine tooth on the side whichever it might be towards the offender for we have seen that some persons cannot voluntarily make their eyebrows oblique yet instantly act in this manner when affected by any real although most trifling cause of distress the power of voluntarily uncovering the canine on one side of the face being thus often wholly lost indicates that it is a rarely used and almost abortive action it is indeed a surprising fact that man should possess the power or should exhibit any tendency to its use for mr sutton has never noticed the snarling action in our nearest allies namely the monkeys in the zoological gardens and he is positive that the baboons though furnished with great canines never act thus but uncover all their teeth when feeling savage and ready for an attack whether the adult anthropomorphous apes in the males of whom the canines are much larger than in the females uncover them when prepared to fight is not known the expression here considered whether that of a playful sneer or ferocious snarl is one of the most curious which occurs in man it reveals his animal descent for no one even if rolling on the ground in a deadly grapple with an enemy and attempting to bite him would try to use his canine teeth more than his other teeth we may readily believe from our affinity to the anthropomorphous apes that our male semi-human progenitors possessed great canine teeth and men are now occasionally born having them of unusually large size with interspaces in the opposite jaw for their reception we may further suspect notwithstanding that we have no support from analogy that our semi-human progenitors uncovered their canine teeth when prepared for battle as we still do when feeling ferocious or when merely sneering at or defying someone without any intention of making a real attack with our teeth end of section eighteen Section 19 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 11. Disdain, Contempt, Disgust, Guilt, Pride, etc. Helplessness, Patience, Affirmation, and Negation. Part 1. Contempt, scorn, and disdain, variously expressed. Derisive smile, gestures expressive of contempt, disgust, guilt, deceit, pride, etc. Helplessness or impotence, patience, obstinacy, shrugging the shoulders common to most of the races of man, signs of affirmation and negation scorn and disdain can hardly be distinguished from contempt excepting that they imply a rather more angry frame of mind 
nor can they be clearly distinguished from the feelings discussed in the last chapter under the terms of sneering and defiance. Disgust is a sensation rather more distinct in its nature and refers to something revolting, primarily in relation to the sense of taste, as actually perceived or vividly imagined, and secondarily to anything which causes a similar feeling through the sense of smell, touch, and even of eyesight. Nevertheless, extreme contempt, or as it is often called, loathing contempt, hardly differs from disgust. These several conditions of the mind are, therefore, nearly related, and each of them may be exhibited in many different ways. Some writers have insisted chiefly on one mode of expression, and others on a different mode. From this circumstance, M. Lemoine has argued that their descriptions are not trustworthy, but we shall immediately see that it is natural that the feelings which we have here to consider should be expressed in many different ways, inasmuch as various habitual actions serve equally well through the principle of association for their expression. Scorn and disdain, as well as sneering and defiance, may be displayed by a slight uncovering of the canine tooth on one side of the face, and this movement appears to graduate into one closely like a smile. Or the smile or laugh may be real, although one of derision and this implies that the offender is so insignificant that he excites only amusement, but the amusement is generally a pretense. Geika, in his answers to my queries, remarks that contempt is commonly shown by his countrymen, the Kafers, by smiling, and the Raja Brook makes the same observation with respect to the Dyaks of Borneo. As laughter is primarily the expression of simple joy, very young children do not, I believe, ever laugh in derision. The partial closure of the eyelids, as Duchesne insists, or the turning away of the eyes or of the whole body, are likewise highly expressive of disdain. These actions seem to declare that the despised person is not worth looking at or is disagreeable to behold. The accompanying photograph by Mr. Raylander shows this form of disdain. It represents a young lady who was supposed to be tearing up the photograph of a despised lover. The most common method of expressing contempt is by movements about the nose or round the mouth, but the latter movements, when strongly pronounced, indicate disgust. The nose may be slightly turned up, which apparently follows from the turning up of the upper lip, or the movement may be abbreviated into the mere wrinkling of the nose. The nose is often slightly contracted so as partly to close the passage, and this is commonly accompanied by a slight snort or expiration. All these actions are the same with those which we employ when we perceive an offensive odor and wish to exclude or expel it. In extreme cases, as Dr. Pitterit remarks, we protrude and raise both lips, or the upper lip alone, so as to close the nostrils as by a valve the nose being thus turned up. We seem thus to say to the despised person that he smells offensively, in nearly the same manner as we express to him by half-closing our eyelids or turning away our faces that he is not worth looking at. It must not, however, be supposed that such ideas actually pass through the mind when we exhibit our contempt, but as whenever we have perceived a disagreeable odor or seen a disagreeable sight. Actions of this kind have been performed. They have become habitual or fixed, and are now employed under any analogous state of mind. Various odd little gestures likewise indicate contempt. For instance, snapping one's fingers. This, as Mr. Taylor remarks, It is not very intelligible as we generally see it, but when we notice that the same sign made quite gently as if rolling some tiny object away between the finger and thumb, or the sign of flipping it away with the thumbnail and forefinger, are usual and well understood deaf and dumb gestures, denoting anything tiny, insignificant, contemptible. It seems as though we had exaggerated and conventionalized a perfectly natural action, so as to lose sight of its original meaning. There is a curious mention of this gesture by Strabo. Mr. Washington Matthews informs me that 
With the Dakota Indians of North America, contempt is shown not only by movements of the face, such as those above described, but conventionally by the hand being closed and held near the breast. Then, as the forearm is suddenly extended, the hand is opened and the fingers separated from each other. If the person at whose expense the sign is made is present, the hand is moved towards him, and the head sometimes averted from him. This sudden extension and opening of the hand perhaps indicates the dropping or throwing away a valueless object. The term disgust, in its simplest sense, means something offensive to the taste. It is curious how readily this feeling is excited by anything unusual in the appearance, odor, or nature of our food. In Tierra del Fuego, a native touched with his finger some cold preserved meat which I was eating at our bivouac, and plainly showed utter disgust at its softness, whilst I felt utter disgust at my food being touched by a naked savage, though his hands did not appear dirty. A smear of soup on a man's beard looks disgusting, though there is, of course, nothing disgusting in the soup itself. I presume that this follows from the strong association in our minds between the sight of food, however circumstanced, and the idea of eating it. As the sensation of disgust primarily arises in connection with the act of eating or tasting, it is natural that its expression should consist chiefly in movements round the mouth. But as disgust also causes annoyance, it is generally accompanied by a frown, and often by gestures as if to push away or to guard oneself against the offensive object. In the two photographs, Mr. Raylander has simulated this expression with some success. With respect to the face, moderate disgust is exhibited in various ways. By the mouth being widely opened, as if to let an offensive morsel drop out, by spitting, by blowing out of the protruded lips, or by a sound as of clearing the throat. Such guttural sounds are written ach or ugh, and their utterance is sometimes accompanied by a shudder, the arms being pressed close to the sides and the shoulders raised in the same manner as when horror is experienced. Extreme disgust is expressed by movements round the mouth identical with those preparatory to the act of vomiting. The mouth is opened widely with the upper lip strongly retracted, which wrinkles the sides of the nose, and with the lower lip protruded and everted as much as possible. This latter movement requires the contraction of the muscles which draws downward the corners of the mouth. It is remarkable how readily and instantly retching or actual vomiting is induced in some persons by the mere idea of having partaken of any unusual food as of an animal which is not commonly eaten, although there is nothing in such food to cause the stomach to reject it. When vomiting results as a reflex action, from some real cause, as from too rich food or tainted meat, or from an emetic. It does not ensue immediately, but generally after a considerable interval of time. Therefore, to account for retching or vomiting, being so quickly and easily excited by a mere idea, the suspicion arises that our progenitors must formerly have had the power, like that possessed by ruminants and some other animals, of voluntarily rejecting food which disagreed with them, or which they thought would disagree with them, and now this power has been lost, as far as the will is concerned, it is called into involuntary action, through the force of a formerly well-established habit, whenever the mind revolts at the idea of having partaken of any kind of food, or at anything disgusting. This suspicion receives support from the fact of which I am assured by Mr. Sutton that the monkeys in the zoological gardens often vomit whilst in perfect health, which looks as if the act were voluntary. We can see that as man is able to communicate by language to his children and others, the knowledge of the kinds of food to be avoided he would have little occasion to use the faculty of voluntary rejection, so that this power would tend to be lost through disuse. As the sense of smell is so intimately connected with that of taste, it is not surprising that an excessively bad odor should excite retching or vomiting in some persons, quite as readily as the thought of revolting food does, 
and that as a further consequence a moderately offensive odor should cause the various expressive movements of disgust the tendency to retch from a fetid odor is immediately strengthened in a curious manner by some degree of habit though soon lost by longer familiarity with the cause of offense and by voluntary restraint for instance i wish to clean the skeleton of a bird which had not been sufficiently macerated and the smell made my servant and myself we not having had much experience in such work wretch so violently that we were compelled to desist during the previous days i had examined some other skeletons which smelt slightly yet the odor did not in the least affect me but subsequently for several days whenever i handled these same skeletons they made me wretch from the answers received from my correspondence it appears that the various movements which have now been described as expressing contempt and disgust prevail throughout a large part of the world dr rothrock for instance answers with a decided affirmative with respect to certain wild indian tribes of north america krantz says that when a greenlander denies anything with contempt or horror he turns up his nose and gives a slight sound through it mr scott has sent me a graphic description of the face of a young hindu at the sight of castor oil which he was compelled occasionally to take mr scott has also seen the same expression on the faces of high caste natives who have approached close to some defiling object Mr. Bridges says that the Fugians express contempt by shooting out the lips and hissing through them, and by turning up the nose. The tendency either to snort through the nose or to make a noise expressed by ug or ach is noticed by several of my correspondents. Shakespeare makes the Duke of Norfolk say, I spit at him, call him a slanderous coward and a villain. So again Falstaff says, Tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face leichhardt remarks that the australians interrupted their speeches by spitting and uttering a noise like poo poo apparently expressive of their disgust and captain burton speaks of certain negroes spitting with disgust upon the ground captain speedy informs me that this is likewise the case with the abyssinians mr Geish says that with the malays of malacca the expression of disgust answers to spitting from the mouth and with the fugians according to mr bridges to spit at one is the highest mark of contempt i never saw disgust more plainly expressed than on the face of one of my infants at the age of five months when for the first time some cold water and again a month afterwards when a piece of ripe cherry was put into his mouth this was shown by the lips and whole mouth assuming a shape which allowed the contents to run or fall quickly out the tongue being likewise protruded these movements were accompanied by a little shudder it was all the more comical as i doubt whether the child felt real disgust the eyes and forehead expressing much surprise and consideration the protrusion of the tongue is letting a nasty object fall out of the mouth may explain how it is that lolling out the tongue universally serves as a sign of contempt and hatred we have now seen that scorn disdain contempt and disgust are expressed in many different ways by movements of the features and by various gestures and that these are the same throughout the world they all consist of actions representing the rejection or exclusion of some real object which we dislike or abhor but which does not excite in us certain other strong emotions such as rage or terror and through the force of habit and association similar actions are performed whenever any analogous sensation arises in our minds jealousy envy avarice revenge suspicion deceit slyness guilt vanity conceit ambition pride humility etc it is doubtful whether the greater number of the above complex states of mind are revealed by any fixed expression sufficiently distinct to be described or delineated when shakespeare speaks of envy as lean-faced or black or pale and jealousy as the green-eyed monster and when spencer describes suspicion as foul ill-favored and grim they must have felt this difficulty nevertheless the above feelings at least many of them 
can be detected by the eye, for instance, conceit. But we are often guided in as much greater degree than we suppose by our previous knowledge of the persons or circumstances. My correspondents almost unanimously answer in the affirmative to my query, whether the expression of guilt and deceit can be recognized among the various races of men, and I have confidence in their answers, as they generally deny that jealousy can thus be recognized. In the cases in which details are given, the eyes are almost always referred to. The guilty man is said to avoid looking at his accuser or to give him stolen looks. The eyes are said to be turned askant, or to waver from side to side, or the eyelids to be lowered and partly closed. This latter remark is made by Mr. Hagenauer with respect to the Australians, and by Geika with respect to the Kaifers. The restless movements of the eyes apparently follow, as will be explained when we treat of blushing, from the guilty man not enduring to meet the gaze of his accuser. I may add that I have observed a guilty expression without a shade of fear in some of my own children at a very early age. In one instance, the expression was unmistakably clear in a child two years and seven months old and led to the detection of his little crime. It was shown, as I record in my notes made at the time, by an unnatural brightness in the eyes and by an odd, affected manner impossible to describe. Slyness is also, I believe, exhibited chiefly by movements about the eyes, for these are less under the control of the will, owing to the force of long-continued habit, than are the movements of the body. Mr. Herbert Spencer remarks, When there is a desire to see something on one side of the visual field without being supposed to see it, the tendency is to check the conspicuous movement of the head, and to make the required adjustment entirely with the eyes, which are therefore drawn very much to one side. Hence, when the eyes are turned to one side, while the face is not turned to the same side, we get the natural language of what is called slyness. Of all the above-named complex emotions, pride, perhaps, is the most plainly expressed. A proud man exhibits his sense of superiority over others by holding his head and body erect. He is haughty, hot or high, and makes himself appear as large as possible so that metaphorically he is said to be swollen or puffed up with pride. A peacock or a turkey cock strutting about with puffed up feathers is sometimes said to be an emblem of pride. The arrogant man looks down on others, and with lowered eyelids hardly condescends to see them, or he may show his contempt by slight movements, such as those before described, about the nostrils or lips. Hence the muscle which everts the lower lip has been called the musculus superbus. In some photographs of patients affected by a monomania of pride, sent me by Dr. Crichton Brown, the head and body were held erect and the mouth firmly closed. This latter action, expressive of decision, follows, I presume, from the proud man feeling perfect self-confidence in himself. The whole expression of pride stands in direct antithesis to that of humility so that nothing need here be said of the latter state of mind. End of section 19。section 20 of the expression of the emotions in man and animals。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer、please visit LibriVox.org。the expression of the emotions in man and animals by charles darwin chapter eleven disdain contempt disgust guilt pride etc helplessness patience affirmation and negation continued part two helplessness impotence shrugging the shoulders when a man wishes to show that he cannot do something, or prevent something being done, he often raises, with a quick movement, both shoulders. At the same time, if the whole gesture is completed, he bends his elbows closely inwards, raising his open hands, turning them outwards, with the fingers separated. The head is often thrown a little on one side. 
the eyebrows are elevated, and this causes wrinkles across the forehead. The mouth is generally opened. I may mention, in order to show how unconsciously the features are thus acted on, that though I had often intentionally shrugged my shoulders to observe how my arms were placed, I was not at all aware that my eyebrows were raised and mouth opened, until I looked at myself in the glass. And since then I have noticed the same movements in the faces of others. In the accompanying plate six, figures three and four, Mr. Raylander has successfully acted the gesture of shrugging the shoulders. Englishmen are much less demonstrative than the men of most other European nations, and they shrug their shoulders far less frequently and energetically than Frenchmen or Italians do. The gesture varies in all degrees from the complex movement just described to only a momentary and scarcely perceptible raising of both shoulders or, as I have noticed in a lady sitting in an armchair, to the mere turning slightly outwards of the open hands with separated fingers. I have never seen very young English children shrug their shoulders, but the following case was observed with care by a medical professor and excellent observer, and has been communicated to me by him. The father of this gentleman was a Parisian, and his mother a Scotch lady. His wife is of British extraction on both sides, and my informant does not believe that she ever shrugged her shoulders in her life. His children have been reared in England, and the nursemaid is a thorough Englishwoman who has never been seen to shrug her shoulders. Now his eldest daughter was observed to shrug her shoulders at the age of between 16 and 18 months, her mother exclaiming at the time, "'Look at the little French girl shrugging her shoulders!' At first she often acted thus, sometimes throwing her head a little backwards and on one side, but she did not, as far as was observed, move her elbows and hands in the usual manner. The habit gradually wore away, and now, when she is a little over four years old, she is never seen to act thus. The father is told that he sometimes shrugs his shoulders, especially when arguing with anyone but it is extremely improbable that his daughter should have imitated him at so early an age, for, as he remarks, she could not possibly have often seen this gesture in him. Moreover, if the habit had been acquired through imitation, it is not probable that it would so soon have been spontaneously discontinued by this child, and, as we shall immediately see by a second child, though the father still lived with his family. This little girl, it may be added, resembles her Parisian grandfather in countenance to an almost absurd degree. She also presents another and very curious resemblance to him, namely, by practicing a singular trick. When she impatiently wants something, she holds out her little hand and rapidly rubs the thumb against the index and middle finger. Now this same trick was frequently performed under the same circumstances by her grandfather. This gentleman's second daughter also shrugged her shoulders before the age of 18 months, and afterward discontinued the habit. It is, of course, possible that she may have imitated her elder sister, but she continued it after her sister had lost the habit. She at first resembled her Parisian grandfather in a less degree than did her sister at the same age, but now in a greater degree. She likewise practices to the present time the peculiar habit of rubbing together, when impatient, her thumb, and two of her forefingers. In this latter case we have a good instance, like those given in a former chapter, of the inheritance of a trick or gesture, for no one, I presume, will attribute to mere coincidence so peculiar a habit as this, which was common to the grandfather and his two grandchildren, who had never seen him. Considering all the circumstances with reference to these children shrugging their shoulders, it can hardly be doubted that they have inherited the habit from their French progenitors, although they have only one quarter French blood in their veins, and although their grandfather did not often shrug his shoulders. There is nothing very unusual, though the fact is interesting, in these children having gained by inheritance a habit during early youth, and then discontinuing it, for it is of frequent occurrence with many kinds of animals that certain characters are retained for a period by the young, and are then lost. As it appeared to me at one time, improbable in a high degree, 
that so complex a gesture as shrugging the shoulders together with the accompanying movements should be innate i was anxious to ascertain whether the blind and deaf laura bridgman who could not have learnt the habit by imitation practised it and i have heard through dr eynes from a lady who has lately had charge of her that she does shrug her shoulders turn in her elbows and raise her eyebrows in the same manner as other people and under the same circumstances i was also anxious to learn whether this gesture was practised by the various races of man especially by those who never had much intercourse with europeans we shall see that they act in this manner but it appears that the gesture is sometimes confined to merely raising or shrugging the shoulders without the other movements mr scott has frequently seen this gesture in the bengalese and dangars the later constituting a distinct race who are employed in the botanic garden at calcutta when for instance they have declared that they could not do some work such as lifting a heavy weight he ordered a bengali to climb a lofty tree but the man with a shrug of his shoulders and a lateral shake of his head said he could not mr scott knowing that the man was lazy thought he could and insisted on his trying his face now became pale his arms dropped to his sides his mouth and eyes were widely opened and again surveying the tree he looked askant at mr scott shrugged his shoulders inverted his elbows extended his open hands and with a few quick lateral shakes of the head declared his inability mr h erskine has likewise seen the natives of india shrugging their shoulders but he has never seen the elbows turned so much inwards as with us and whilst shrugging their shoulders they sometimes lay their uncrossed hands on their breasts with the wild malays of the interior of malacca and with the bugis true malays though speaking a different language mr geach has often seen this gesture i presume that it is complete as in answer to my query descriptive of the movements of the shoulders arms hands and face mr geach remarks it is performed in a beautiful style i have lost an extract from a scientific voyage in which shrugging the shoulders by some natives micronesians of the caroline archipelago in the pacific ocean was well described captain speedy informs me that the abyssinians shrug their shoulders but enters into no details mr asa gray saw an arab dragoman in alexandria acting exactly as described in my query when an old gentleman on whom he attended would not go in the proper direction which had been pointed out to him mr washington matthews says in reference to the wild indian tribes of the western parts of the united states i have on a few occasions detected men using a slight apologetic shrug but the rest of the demonstration which you described i have not witnessed fritz muller informs me that he has seen the negroes in brazil shrugging their shoulders but it is of course possible that they may have learned to do so by imitating the portuguese mrs barber has never seen this gesture with the kafirs of south africa and geika judging from his answer did not even understand what was meant by my description mr swinhoe is also doubtful about the chinese but he has seen them under the circumstances which would make us shrug our shoulders press their right elbow against their side raise their eyebrows lift up their hand with the palm directed toward the person addressed and shake it from right to left lastly with respect to the australians four of my informants answer by a simple negative and one by a simple affirmative mr bunnett who has had excellent opportunities for observation on the borders of the colony of victory also answers by a yes adding that the gesture is performed in a more subdued and less demonstrative manner than is the case with civilized nations this circumstance may account for its not having been noticed by four of my informants these statements relating to europeans hindus the hill tribes of india malays micronesians abyssinians arabs negroes indians of north america and apparently to the australians many of these natives having had scarcely any intercourse with europeans are sufficient to show that shrugging the shoulders accompanied in some cases by other proper movements is a gesture natural to mankind this gesture implies an unintentional or unavoidable action on our part or one that we cannot perform or an action performed by another person 
which we cannot prevent. It accompanies such speeches as, It was not my fault. It is impossible for me to grant this favor. He must follow his own course. I cannot stop him. Shrugging the shoulders likewise expresses patience or the absence of any intention to resist. Hence the muscles which raise the shoulders are sometimes called, as I have been informed by an artist, the patience muscles. Shylock the Jew says, Signor Antonio, many a time and oft, in the Rialto you have rated me. About my monies and usances, still I have borne it with a patient shrug. Merchant of Venice, Act 1, Scene 3. Sir Charles Bell has given a lifelike figure of a man who is shrinking back from some terrible danger and is on the point of screaming out in abject terror. He is represented with his shoulders lifted up almost to his ears, and this at once declares that there is no thought of resistance. A shrugging the shoulders generally implies, I cannot do this or that. So, by a slight chance, it sometimes implies, I won't do it. The movement then expresses a dogged determination not to act. Olmsted describes an Indian in Texas as giving a great shrug to his shoulders when he was informed that a party of men were Germans and not Americans, thus expressing that he would have nothing to do with them. Sulky and obstinate children may be seen with both their shoulders raised high up, but this movement is not associated with the others which generally accompany a true shrug. An excellent observer in describing a young man who was determined not to yield to his father's desire says, He thrust his hands deep down into his pockets and set up his shoulders to his ears, which was a good warning that, come right or wrong, this rock should fly from its firm base as soon as Jack would, and that any remonstrance on the subject was purely futile. As soon as the son got his own way, he put his shoulders into their natural position. Resignation is sometimes shown by the open hands being placed one over the other on the lower part of the body. I should not have thought this little gesture worth even a passing notice had not Dr. William Ogle remarked to me that he had two or three times observed it in patients who were preparing for operations under chloroform. They exhibited no great fear, but seemed to declare by this posture of their hands that they had made up their minds and were resigned to the inevitable. We may now inquire why men in all parts of the world, when they feel, whether or not they wish to show this feeling, that they cannot or will not do something, or will not resist something if done by another, shrug their shoulders, at the same time often bending in their elbows, showing the palms of their hands with extended fingers, often throwing their heads a little on one side, raising their eyebrows and opening their mouths. These states of the mind are either simply passive or show a determination not to act. None of the above movements are of the least service. The explanation lies, I cannot doubt, in the principle of unconscious antithesis. This principle here seems to come into play as clearly as in the case of a dog, who, when feeling savage, puts himself in the proper attitude for attacking and for making himself appear terrible to his enemy but as soon as he feels affectionate, throws his whole body into a directly opposite attitude, though this is of no direct use to him. Let it be observed how an indignant man who resents and will not submit to some inquiry holds his head erect, squares his shoulders, and expands his chest. He often clenches his fist and puts one or both arms in the proper position for attack or defense, with the muscles of his limbs rigid. He frowns, that is, he contracts and lowers his brows, and being determined, closes his mouth. The actions and attitude of a helpless man are in every one of these respects exactly the reverse. In plate six, we may imagine one of the figures on the left side to have just said, What do you mean by insulting me? And one of the figures on the right to answer, I really could not help it. The helpless man unconsciously contracts the muscles of his forehead, which are antagonistic to those that cause a frown, and thus raises his eyebrows. At the same time, he relaxes the muscles about the mouth, so that the lower jaw drops. The antithesis is complete in every detail, not only in the movements of the features, but in the position of the limbs and in the attitude of the whole body. 
as may be seen in the accompanying plate as the helpless or apologetic man often wishes to show his state of mind he then acts in a conspicuous or demonstrative manner in accordance with the fact that squaring the elbows and clenching the fists are gestures by no means universal with the men of all races when they feel indignant and are prepared to attack their enemy so it appears that a helpless or apologetic frame of mind is expressed in many parts of the world by merely shrugging the shoulders without turning inwards the elbows and opening the hands the man or child who is obstinate or one who is resigned to some great misfortune has in neither case any idea of resistance by active means and he expresses this state of mind by simply keeping his shoulders raised or he may possibly fold his arms across his breast signs of affirmation or approval and of negation or disapproval nodding and shaking the head i was curious to ascertain how far the common signs used by us in affirmation and negation were general throughout the world these signs are indeed to a certain extent expressive of our feelings as we give a vertical nod of approval with a smile to our children when we approve of their conduct and shake our heads laterally with a frown when we disapprove with infants the first act of denial consists in refusing food and i repeatedly noticed with my own infants that they did so by withdrawing their heads laterally from the breast or from anything offered them in a spoon in accepting food and in taking it into their mouths they incline their heads forwards since making these observations i have been informed that the same idea had occurred to charma it deserves notice that in accepting or taking food there is only a single movement forward and a single nod implies an affirmation on the other hand in refusing food especially if it be pressed on them children frequently move their heads several times from side to side as we do in shaking our heads in negation moreover in the case of refusal the head is not rarely thrown backwards or the mouth is closed so that these movements might likewise come to serve as signs of negation mr wedgwood remarks on this subject that when the voice is exerted with closed teeth or lips it produces the sound of the letter n or m hence we may account for the use of the particle ne to signify negation and possibly also of the greek m in the same sense that these signs are innate or instinctive at least with anglo-saxons is rendered highly probable by the blind and deaf laura bridgman constantly accompanying her yes with the common affirmative nod and her no with our negative shake of the head had not mr lieber stated to the contrary i should have imagined that these gestures might have been acquired or learnt by her considering her wonderful sense of touch and appreciation of the movements of others with microcephalous idiots who are so degraded that they never learn to speak one of them is described by vote as answering when asked whether he wished for more food or drink by inclining or shaking his head schmaltz in his remarkable dissertation on the education of the deaf and dumb as well as of children raised only one degree above idiocy assumes that they can always both make and understand the common signs of affirmation and negation nevertheless if we look to the various races of man these signs are not so universally employed as i should have expected yet they seem too general to be ranked as altogether conventional or artificial my informants assert that both signs are used by the malays by the natives of ceylon the chinese the negroes of the guinea coast and according to geika by the kafirs of south africa though with these latter people mrs barber has never seen a lateral shake used as a negative with respect to the australians seven observers agree that a nod is given in affirmation five agree about a lateral shake in negation accompanied or not by some word but mr dyson lacey has never seen this latter sign in queensland and mr bulmer says that in gippsland a negative is expressed by throwing the head a little backwards and putting out the tongue at the northern extremity of the continent near torres straits the natives when uttering a negative don't shake the head with it but holding up the right hand shake it by turning it half round and back again two or three times the throwing back of the head with a cluck of the tongue is said to be used as a negative by the modern greeks and turks the latter people expressing yes by a movement like that made by us when we shake our heads 
the abyssinians as i am informed by captain speedy express a negative by jerking the head to the right shoulder together with a slight cluck the mouth being closed an affirmation is expressed by the head being thrown backwards and the eyebrows raised for an instant the tagals of luzon in the philippine archipelago as i hear from dr adolf meyer when they say yes also throw the head backwards according to the rajah brook the Dayaks of Borneo express an affirmation by raising the eyebrows, and a negation by slightly contracting them, together with a peculiar look from the eyes. With the Arabs on the Nile, Professor and Mrs. Asa Gray concluded that nodding in affirmation was rare, whilst shaking the head in negation was never used, and was not even understood by them. With the Eskimo, a nod means yes, and a wink, no. The New Zealanders elevate the head and chin in place of nodding acquiescence. With the Hindus, Mr. H. Erskine concludes, from inquiries made from experienced Europeans and from native gentlemen, that the signs of affirmation and negation vary, a nod and a lateral shake being sometimes used as we do, but a negative is more commonly expressed by the head being thrown suddenly backwards and a little to one side with a cluck of the tongue. What the meaning may be of this cluck of the tongue, which has been observed with various people, I cannot imagine. A native gentleman stated that affirmation is frequently shown by the head being thrown to the left. I asked Mr. Scott to attend particularly to this point, and after repeated observations, he believes that a vertical nod is not commonly used by the natives in affirmation, but that the head is first thrown backwards, either to the left or to the right, and then jerked obliquely forwards only once. This movement would perhaps have been described by a less careful observer as a lateral shake. He also states that in negation the head is usually held nearly upright and shaken several times. Mr. Bridges informs me that the Fugians nod their heads vertically in affirmation and shake them laterally in denial. With the wild Indians of North America, according to Mr. Washington Matthews, nodding and shaking the head have been learnt from Europeans and are not naturally employed. They express affirmation by describing with the hand all the fingers except the index being flexed a curve downwards and outwards from the body, whilst negation is expressed by moving the open hand outwards with the palm facing inwards. Other observers state that the sign of affirmation with these Indians is the forefinger being raised and then lowered and pointed to the ground, or the hand is waved straight forward from the face, and that the sign of negation is the finger or whole hand shaken from side to side. This latter movement probably represents in all cases the lateral shaking of the head. The Italians are said, in like manner, to move the lifted finger from right to left in negation, as indeed we English sometimes do. On the whole, we find considerable diversity in the signs of affirmation and negation in the different races of man. With respect to negation, if we admit that the shaking of the finger or hand from side to side is symbolic of the lateral movement of the head, and if we admit that the sudden backward movement of the head represents one of the actions often practiced by young children in refusing food, then there is much uniformity throughout the world in the signs of negation, and we can see how they originated. The most marked exceptions are presented by the Arabs, Eskimo, some Australian tribes, and Dayaks. With the latter, a frown is the sign of negation, and with us, frowning often accompanies a lateral shake of the head. With respect to nodding in affirmation, the exceptions are rather more numerous, namely with some of the Hindus, with the Turks, Abyssinians, Dayaks, Tagals, and New Zealanders. The eyebrows are sometimes raised in affirmation as a person in bending his head forwards and downwards naturally looks up to the person whom he addresses, he will be apt to raise his eyebrows. And this sign may thus have arisen as an abbreviation. So again with the New Zealanders, the lifting up of the chin and head in affirmation may perhaps represent, in an abbreviated form, the upward movement of the head after it has been nodded forwards and downwards. End of section 20. Section 21 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12. Surprise, Astonishment, Fear, Horror. Part 1. Surprise, Astonishment, Elevation of the Eyebrows, Opening the Mouth, Protrusion of the Lips, Gestures Accompanying Surprise, Admiration, Fear, Terror, Erection of the Hair, Contraction of the Platysma Muscle, Dilatation of the Pupils, Horror, Conclusion. Attention, if sudden and close, graduates into surprise and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. The latter frame of mind is closely akin to terror. Attention is shown by the eyebrows being slightly raised, and as this state increases into surprise, they are raised to a much greater extent, with the eyes and mouth widely open. The raising of the eyebrows is necessary in order that the eyes should be opened quickly and widely, and this movement produces transverse wrinkles across the forehead. The degree to which the eyes and mouth are open corresponds with the degree of surprise felt, but these movements must be coordinated, for a widely opened mouth, with eyebrows only slightly raised, results in a meaningless grimace, as Dr. Duchesne has shown in one of his photographs. On the other hand, a person may often be seen to pretend surprise by merely raising his eyebrows. Dr. Duchenne has given a photograph of an old man with his eyebrows well elevated and arched by the galvanization of the frontal muscle, and with his mouth voluntarily opened. This figure expresses surprise with much truth. I showed it to 24 persons without a word of explanation, and one alone did not at all understand what was intended. A second person answered terror, which is not far wrong. Some of the others, however, added to the words surprise or astonishment, the epithets horrified, woeful, painful, or disgusted. The eyes and mouth being widely open is an expression universally recognized as one of surprise or astonishment. Thus, Shakespeare says, I saw a smith stand with open mouth swallowing a tailor's news. King John, Act 4, Scene 2. And again, they seemed almost with staring on one another, to tear the cases of their eyes. There was speech in the dumbness, language in their very gesture. They looked as they had heard of a world destroyed. Winter's Tale, Act 5, Scene 2. My informants answer with remarkable uniformity to the same effect, with respect to the various races of man, the above movements of the features being often accompanied by certain gestures and sounds, presently to be described. Twelve observers in different parts of Australia agree on this head. Mr. Winwood Reed has observed this expression with the Negroes on the Guinea coast. The chief Gaika and others answer yes to my query with respect to the Kafirs of South Africa and so do others emphatically with reference to the Abyssinians, Ceylonese, Chinese, Fuegians, various tribes of North America, and New Zealanders. With the latter, Mr. Stack states that the expression is more plainly shown by certain individuals than by others, though all endeavor as much as possible to conceal their feelings. The Dayaks of Borneo are said by the Raja Brook, to open their eyes widely when astonished, often swinging their heads to and fro and beating their breasts. Mr. Scott informs me that the workmen in the botanic gardens at Calcutta are strictly ordered not to smoke, but they often disobey this order, and when suddenly surprised in the act, they first open their eyes and mouths widely. They then often slightly shrug their shoulders as they perceive that discovery is inevitable or frown and stamp on the ground from vexation. Soon they recover from their surprise and abject fear is exhibited by the relaxation of all their muscles. Their heads seem to sink between their shoulders. 
their fallen eyes wander to and fro, and they supplicate forgiveness. The well-known Australian explorer, Mr. Stewart, has given a striking account of stupefied amazement, together with terror, in a native who had never before seen a man on horseback. Mr. Stewart approached unseen and called to him from a little distance. He turned round and saw me. What he imagined I was, I do not know, but a finer picture of fear and astonishment I never saw. He stood incapable of moving a limb, riveted to the spot, mouth open and eyes staring. He remained motionless until our black got within a few yards of him, when suddenly throwing down his waddies, he jumped into a mulga bush as high as he could get. He could not speak, and answered not a word to the inquiries made by the black, but trembling from head to foot, waved with his hand for us to be off. That the eyebrows are raised by an innate or instinctive impulse may be inferred from the fact that Laura Bridgman invariably acts thus when astonished, as I have been assured by the lady who has lately had charge of her. As surprise is excited by something unexpected or unknown, we naturally desire, when startled, to perceive the cause as quickly as possible, and we consequently open our eyes fully so that the field of vision may be increased, and the eyeballs moved easily in any direction. But this hardly accounts for the eyebrows being so greatly raised as is the case, and for the wild staring of the open eyes. The explanation lies, I believe, in the impossibility of opening the eyes with great rapidity by merely raising the upper lids. To effect this, the eyebrows must be lifted energetically. Any one who will try to open his eyes as quickly as possible before a mirror will find that he acts thus. And the energetic lifting up of the eyebrows opens the eyes so widely that they stare, the white being exposed all round the iris. Moreover, the elevation of the eyebrows is an advantage in looking upwards, for as long as they are lowered, they impede our vision in this direction. Sir C. Bell gives a curious little proof of the part which the eyebrows play in opening the eyelids. In the stupidly drunken man, all the muscles are relaxed, and the eyelids consequently droop, in the same manner as when we are falling asleep. To counteract this tendency, the drunkard raises his eyebrows and this gives to him a puzzled, foolish look, as is well represented in one of Hogarth's drawings. The habit of raising the eyebrows having once been gained in order to see as quickly as possible all around us, the movement would follow from the force of association whenever astonishment was felt from any cause, even from a sudden sound or an idea. With adult persons, when the eyebrows are raised, the whole forehead becomes much wrinkled in transverse lines, but with children this occurs only to a slight degree. The wrinkles run in lines concentric with each eyebrow and are partially confluent in the middle. They are highly characteristic of the expression of surprise or astonishment. Each eyebrow, when raised, becomes also, as Duchenne remarks, more arched than it was before. The cause of the mouth being opened when astonishment is felt is a much more complex affair, and several causes apparently concur in leading to this movement. It has often been supposed that the sense of hearing is thus rendered more acute, but I have watched persons listening intently to a slight noise, the nature and source of which they knew perfectly, and they did not open their mouths. Therefore, I at one time imagined that the open mouth might aid in distinguishing the direction whence the sound proceeded, by giving another channel for its entrance into the ear through the eustachian tube. But Dr. W. Ogle has been so kind as to search the best recent authorities on the functions of the eustachian tube, and he informs me that it is almost conclusively proved that it remains closed except during the act of deglutition, and that in persons in whom the tube remains abnormally open. The sense of hearing, as far as external sounds are concerned, is by no means improved. On the contrary, it is impaired by the respiratory sounds being rendered more distinct. If a watch be placed within the mouth but not allowed to touch the sides, the ticking is heard much less plainly than when held outside. In persons in whom from disease or a cold the eustachian tube is permanently or temporarily closed, 
the sense of hearing is injured, but this may be accounted for by mucus accumulating within the tube and the consequent exclusion of air. We may therefore infer that the mouth is not kept open under the sense of astonishment for the sake of hearing sounds more distinctly, notwithstanding that most deaf people keep their mouths open. Every sudden emotion, including astonishment, quickens the actions of the heart, and with it the respiration. Now we can breathe, as Gratiolet remarks, and it appears to me to be the case, much more quietly through the open mouth than through the nostrils. Therefore, when we wish to listen intently to any sound, we either stop breathing or breathe as quietly as possible by opening our mouths, at the same time keeping our bodies motionless. One of my sons was awakened in the night by a noise under circumstances which naturally led to great care, and after a few minutes he perceived that his mouth was widely open. He then became conscious that he had opened it for the sake of breathing as quietly as possible. This view receives support from the reverse case which occurs with dogs. A dog, when panting after exercise or on a hot day, breathes loudly. But if his attention be suddenly aroused, he suddenly pricks his ears to listen, shuts his mouth, and breathes quietly, as he is enabled to do through his nostrils. When the attention is concentrated for a length of time with fixed earnestness on any object or subject, all the organs of the body are forgotten and neglected. And as the nervous energy of each individual is limited in amount, little is transmitted to any part of the system, excepting that which is at the time brought into energetic action. Therefore, many of the muscles tend to become relaxed and the jaw drops from its own weight. This will account for the dropping of the jaw and open mouth of a man stupefied with amazement, and perhaps, when less strongly affected, I have noticed this appearance, as I find recorded in my notes, in very young children when they were only moderately surprised. There is still another and highly effective cause leading to the mouth being opened when we are astonished, and more especially when we are suddenly startled. We can draw a full and deep inspiration much more easily through the widely open mouth than through the nostrils. Now, when we start at any sudden sound or sight, almost all the muscles of the body are involuntarily and momentarily thrown into strong action for the sake of guarding ourselves against or jumping away from the danger, which we habitually associate with anything unexpected. But we always unconsciously prepare ourselves for any great exertion, as formerly explained, by first taking a deep and full inspiration, and we consequently open our mouths. If no exertion follows, and we still remain astonished, we cease for a time to breathe, or breathe as quietly as possible, in order that every sound may be distinctly heard. Or again, if our attention continues long and earnestly absorbed, all our muscles become relaxed, and the jaw, which was at first suddenly opened, remains dropped. Thus, several causes concur towards the same movement, whenever surprise, astonishment, or amazement is felt. Although, when thus affected, our mouths are generally opened, yet the lips are often a little protruded. This fact reminds us of the same movement, though in a much more strongly marked degree, in the chimpanzee and orang when astonished. As a strong expiration naturally follows the deep inspiration which accompanies the first sense of startled surprise, and as the lips are often protruded, the various sounds which are then commonly uttered can apparently be accounted for. But sometimes a strong expiration alone is heard. Thus, Laura Bridgman, when amazed, rounds and protrudes her lips, opens them, and breathes strongly. One of the commonest sounds is a deep O, oh, and this would naturally follow, as explained by Helmholtz, from the mouth being moderately opened and the lips protruded. On a quiet night, some rockets were fired from the Beagle in a little creek in Tahiti to amuse the natives, and as each rocket was let off, there was absolute silence. 
but this was invariably followed by a deep groaning O, oh, resounding all round the bay. Mr. Washington Matthews says that the North American Indians express astonishment by a groan, and the Negroes on the west coast of Africa, according to Mr. Winwood Reed, protrude their lips and make a sound like, hey, hey. If the mouth is not much opened, whilst the lips are considerably protruded, a blowing, hissing, or whistling noise is produced. Mr. R. Bro Smith informs me that an Australian from the interior was taken to the theater to see an acrobat rapidly turning head over heels. He was greatly astonished and protruded his lips, making a noise with his mouth as if blowing out a match. According to Mr. Bulmer, the Australians, when surprised, utter the exclamation, Corky! And to do this, the mouth is drawn out as if going to whistle. We Europeans often whistle as a sign of surprise. Thus, in a recent novel, it is said, Here the man expressing his astonishment and disapprobation by a prolonged whistle. A Kaffir girl, as Mr. J. Mansell Wheel informs me, on hearing of the high price of an article, raised her eyebrows and whistled, just as a European would. Mr. Wedgwood remarks that such sounds are written down as whoo, and they serve as interjections for surprise. According to three other observers, the Australians often evince astonishment by a clucking noise. Europeans also sometimes express gentle surprise by a little clicking noise of nearly the same kind. We have seen that when we are startled, the mouth is suddenly opened, and if the tongue happens to be then pressed closely against the palate, its sudden withdrawal will produce a sound of this kind, which might thus come to express surprise. Turning to gestures of the body. A surprised person often raises his open hands high above his head or by bending his arms only to the level of his face. The flat palms are directed towards the person who causes this feeling and the straightened fingers are separated. This gesture is represented by Mr. Rij Lander in Plate 7, Figure 1, in The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. Two of the apostles have their hands half uplifted, clearly expressive of their astonishment. A trustworthy observer told me that he had lately met his wife under most unexpected circumstances. She started, opened her mouth and eyes very widely, and threw up both her arms above her head. Several years ago, I was surprised by seeing several of my young children earnestly doing something together on the ground but the distance was too great for me to ask what they were about. Therefore, I threw up my open hands with extended fingers above my head, and as soon as I had done this, I became conscious of the action. I then waited, without saying a word, to see if my children had understood this gesture, and as they came running to me, they cried out, We saw that you were astonished at us. I do not know whether this gesture is common to the various races of man, as I neglected to make inquiries on this head. That it is innate or natural may be inferred from the fact that Laura Bridgman, when amazed, spreads her arms and turns her hands with extended fingers upwards. Nor is it likely, considering that the feelings of surprise is generally a brief one, that she should have learnt this gesture through her keen sense of touch. Hushki describes a somewhat different yet allied gesture, which he says is exhibited by persons when astonished. They hold themselves erect with the features as before described, but with the straightened arms extended backwards, the stretched fingers being separated from each other. I have never myself seen this gesture, but Hushki is probably correct, for a friend asked another man how he would express great astonishment, and he at once threw himself into this attitude. These gestures are, I believe, 
explicable on the principles of antithesis. We have seen that an indignant man holds his head erect, squares his shoulders, turns out his elbows, often clenches his fist, frowns, and closes his mouth, whilst the attitude of a helpless man is in every one of these details the reverse. Now, a man in an ordinary frame of mind, doing nothing and thinking of nothing in particular, usually keeps his two arms suspended laxly by his sides, with his hands somewhat flexed and the fingers near together. Therefore, to raise the arms suddenly, either the whole arms or the forearms, to open the palms flat and to separate the fingers, or, again, to straighten the arms, extending them backwards with separated fingers, are movements in complete antithesis to those preserved under an indifferent frame of mind. And they are, in consequence, unconsciously assumed by an astonished man. There is also often a desire to display surprise in a conspicuous manner, and the above attitudes are well fitted for this purpose. It may be asked, why should surprise, in only a few other states of the mind, be exhibited by movements in antithesis to others? But this principle will not be brought into play in the case of those emotions, such as terror, great joy, suffering, or rage, which naturally lead to certain lines of action and produce certain effects on the body. For the whole system is thus preoccupied, and these emotions are already thus expressed with the greatest plainness. There is another little gesture, expressive of astonishment, of which I can offer no explanation, namely, the hand being placed over the mouth or on some part of the head. This has been observed with so many races of man that it must have some natural origin. A wild Australian was taken into a large room full of official papers, which surprised him greatly, and he cried out, cluck, 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 putting the back of his hand towards his lips. Mrs. Barber says that the Kafirs and Fingos express astonishment by a serious look and by placing the right hand upon the mouth littering the word mawo, which means wonderful. The Bushmen are said to put their right hands to their necks, bending their heads backwards. Mr. Winwood Reed has observed that the Negroes on the west coast of Africa, when surprised, clap their hands to their mouths, saying at the same time, My mouth cleaves to me, i.e., to my hands and he has heard that this is their usual gesture on such occasions. Captain Speedy informs me that the Abyssinians place their right hand to the forehead with the palm outside. Lastly, Mr. Washington Matthews states that the conventional sign of astonishment with the wild tribes of the western parts of the United States is made by placing the half-closed hand over the mouth. In doing this, the head is often bent forwards, and words or low groans are sometimes uttered. Catlin makes the same remark about the hand being pressed over the mouth by the Mandans and other Indian tribes. Admiration. Little need be said on this head. Admiration apparently consists of surprise associated with some pleasure and a sense of approval. When vividly felt, the eyes are opened and the eyebrows raised. The eyes become bright instead of remaining blank, as under simple astonishment, and the mouth, instead of gaping open, expands into a smile. Fear, terror. The word fear seems to be derived from what is sudden and dangerous, and that of terror from the trembling of the vocal organs and body. I use the word terror for extreme fear, but some writers think it ought to be confined to cases in which the imagination is more particularly concerned. Fear is often preceded by astonishment and is so far akin to it that both lead to the senses of sight and hearing being instantly aroused. In both cases, the eyes and mouth are widely opened 
and the eyebrows raised. The frightened man at first stands like a statue motionless and breathless, or crouches down as if instinctively to escape observation. The heart beats quickly and violently, so that it palpitates or knocks against the ribs. But it is very doubtful whether it then works more efficiently than usual, so as to send a greater supply of blood to all parts of the body, for the skin instantly becomes pale, as during incipient faintness. This paleness of the surface, however, is probably in large part or exclusively due to the vasomotor center being affected in such a manner as to cause the contraction of the small arteries of the skin. That the skin is much affected under the sense of great fear we see in the marvelous and inexplicable manner in which perspiration immediately exudes from it. This exudation is all the more remarkable, as the surface is then cold, and hence the term a cold sweat, whereas the sudorific glands are properly excited into action when the surface is heated. The hairs also on the skin stand erect, and the superficial muscles shiver. In connection with the disturbed action of the heart, the breathing is hurried. The salivary glands act imperfectly. The mouth becomes dry and is often opened and shut. I have also noticed that under slight fear, there is a strong tendency to yawn. One of the best marked symptoms is the trembling of all the muscles of the body, and this is often first seen in the lips. From this cause and from the dryness of the mouth, the voice becomes husky or indistinct or may altogether fail. Obstupui steteruntque, come et vox faucibus hisit. Of vague fear there is a well-known and grand description in Job. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Job 4.13 as fear increases into an agony of terror, we behold, as under all violent emotions, diversified results. The heart beats wildly, or may fail to act, and faintness ensue. There is a death-like pallor. The breathing is labored. The wings of the nostrils are wildly dilated. There is a gasping and convulsive motion of the lips, a tremor on the hollow cheek, a gulping and catching of the throat. The uncovered and protruding eyeballs are fixed on the object of terror, or they may roll restlessly from side to side. Huc iluc volvens, oculos totumque pererat. The pupils are said to be enormously dilated. All the muscles of the body may become rigid, or may be thrown into convulsive movements. The hands are alternately clenched and opened often with a twitching movement. The arms may be protruded, as if to avert some dreadful danger, or may be thrown wildly over the head. The Reverend Mr. Hagenauer has seen this latter action in a terrified Australian. In other cases, there is a sudden and uncontrollable tendency to headlong flight, and so strong is this that the boldest soldiers may be seized with a sudden panic. As fear rises to an extreme pitch, the dreadful scream of terror is heard. Great beads of sweat stand on the skin. All the muscles of the body are relaxed. Utter prostration soon follows, and the mental powers fail. The intestines are affected. The sphincter muscles cease to act and no longer retain the contents of the body. End of section 21.
Section 22 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick McAfee, Chicago, USA. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12. Surprise, Astonishment, Fear, Horror, Part 2. Dr. J. Crichton Brown has given me so striking an account of intense fear in an insane woman aged 35 that the description, though painful, ought not to be omitted. When a paroxysm seizes her, she screams out, This is hell! There is a black woman! I can't get out! And other such exclamations. When thus screaming, her movements are those of alternate tension and tremor. For one instant, she clenches her hands, holds her arms out before her in a stiff, semi-flexed position, then suddenly bends her body forwards, sways rapidly to and fro, draws her fingers through her hair, clutches at her neck, and tries to tear off her clothes. The sternocleidomastoid muscles, which serve to bend the head on the chest, stand out prominently, as if swollen, and the skin in front of them is much wrinkled. Her hair, which is cut short at the back of her head, and is smooth when she is calm, now stands on end, that in front being disheveled by the movements of her hands. The countenance expresses great mental agony. The skin is flushed over the face and neck, down to the clavicles, and the veins of the forehead and neck stand out like thick cords. The lower lip drops and is somewhat everted. The mouth is kept half open with the lower jaw projecting. The cheeks are hollow and deeply furrowed in curved lines running from the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth. The nostrils themselves are raised and extended. The eyes are widely opened and beneath them the skin appears swollen. The pupils are large. The forehead is wrinkled transversely in many folds and at the inner extremities of the eyebrows it is strongly furrowed in diverging lines produced by the powerful and persistent contraction of the corrugators. Mr. Bell has also described an agony of terror and of despair which he witnessed in a murderer whilst carried to the place of execution in Turin. On each side of the car the officiating priests were seated, and in the center sat the criminal himself. It was impossible to witness the condition of this unhappy wretch without terror, and yet, as if impelled by some strange infatuation, it was equally impossible not to gaze upon an object so wild, so full of horror. He seemed about thirty-five years of age, of large and muscular form, his countenance marked by strong and savage features, half-naked, pale as death, agonized with terror, every limb strained in anguish, his hands clenched convulsively, the sweat breaking out on his bent and contracted brow. He kissed incessantly the figure of our Savior, painted on the flag which was suspended before him, but with an agony of wildness and despair, of which nothing ever exhibited on the stage can give the slightest conception. I will add only one other case, illustrative of a man utterly prostrated by terror. An atrocious murderer of two persons was brought into a hospital under the mistaken impression that he had poisoned himself, and Dr. W. Ogle carefully watched him the next morning while he was being handcuffed and taken away by the police. His pallor was extreme, and his prostration so great that he was hardly able to dress himself. His skin perspired, and his eyelids and head drooped so much that it was impossible to catch even a glimpse of his eyes. His lower jaw hung down. There was no contraction of any facial muscle, and Dr. Ogle is almost certain that the hair did not stand on end, for he observed it narrowly, as it had been dyed for the sake of concealment. With respect to fear, as exhibited by the various races of man, my informants agree that the signs are the same as with Europeans. They are displayed in an exaggerated degree with the Hindus and natives of Ceylon. Mr. Geach has seen Malays, when terrified, turn pale and shake, 
and Mr. Bro Smith states that a native Australian, being on one occasion much frightened, showed a complexion as nearly approaching to what we call paleness, as can well be conceived in the case of a very black man. Mr. Dyson Lacey has seen extreme fear shown in an Australian by a nervous twitching of the hands, feet, and lips, and by the perspiration standing on the skin. Many savages do not repress the signs of fear so much as Europeans, and they often tremble greatly. With the Kafir, Gaika says, in his rather quaint English, the shaking of the body is much experienced, and the eyes are widely open. With savages, the sphincter muscles are often relaxed, just as may be observed in much frightened dogs, and as I have seen with monkeys when terrified by being caught. The Erection of the Hair Some of the signs of fear deserve a little further consideration. Poets continually speak of the hair standing on end. Brutus says to the ghost of Caesar, That makes my blood cold and my hair to stare. And Cardinal Beaufort, after the murder of Gloucester, exclaims, Comb down his hair. Look, look, it stands upright. As I did not feel sure whether writers of fiction might not have applied to man what they had often observed in animals, I begged for information from Dr. Crichton Brown with respect to the insane. He states in answer that he has repeatedly seen their hair erected under the influence of sudden and extreme terror. For instance, it is occasionally necessary to inject morphia, under the skin of an insane woman who dreads the operation extremely, although it causes very little pain, for she believes that poison is being introduced into her system, and that her bones will be softened, and her flesh turned to dust. She becomes deadly pale, her limbs are stiffened by a sort of titanic spasm, and her hair is partially erected on the front of the head. Dr. Brown further remarks that the bristling of the hair which is so common in the insane, is not always associated with terror. It is perhaps most frequently seen in chronic maniacs who rave incoherently and have destructive impulses, but it is during their paroxysms of violence that the bristling is most observable. The fact of the hair becoming erect under the influence both of rage and fear agrees perfectly with what we have seen in the lower animals. Dr. Brown adduces several cases in evidence. Thus with a man now in the asylum, before the recurrence of each maniacal paroxysm, the hair rises up from his forehead like the mane of a Shetland pony. He has sent me photographs of two women taken in the intervals between their paroxysms, and he adds with respect to one of these women that the state of her hair is a sure and convenient criterion of her mental condition. I have had one of these photographs copied, and the engraving gives, if viewed from a little distance, a faithful representation of the original, with the exception that the hair appears rather too coarse and too much curled. The extraordinary condition of the hair in the insane is due, not only to its erection, but to its dryness and harshness, consequent on the subcutaneous glands failing to act. Dr. Bucknell has said that a lunatic is a lunatic to his finger's ends. He might have added, and often to the extremity of each particular hair. Dr. Brown mentions as an empirical confirmation of the relation which exists in the insane between the state of their hair and minds, that the wife of a medical man who has charge of a lady suffering from acute melancholia with a strong fear of death for herself her husband and children, reported verbally to him the day before receiving my letter as follows. I think Mrs. will soon improve, for her hair is getting smooth, and I always notice that our patients get better whenever their hair ceases to be rough and unmanageable. Dr. Brown attributes the persistently rough condition of the hair in many insane patients in part to their minds being always somewhat disturbed, and in part to the effects of habit, that is, to the hair being frequently and strongly erected during their many recurrent paroxysms. 
In patients in whom the bristling of the hair is extreme, the disease is generally permanent and mortal, but in others in whom the bristling is moderate, as soon as they recover their health of mind, the hair recovers its smoothness. In a previous chapter, we have seen that with animals, the hairs are erected by the contraction of minute, unstriped, and involuntary muscles, which run to each separate follicle. In addition to this action, Mr. J. Wood has clearly ascertained by experiment, as he informs me, that with man, the hairs on the front of the head, which slope forwards, and those on the back, which slope backwards, are raised in opposite directions by the contraction of the occipito frontalis, or scalp muscle, so that this muscle seems to aid in the erection of the hairs on the head of man in the same manner as the homologous paniculus carnosus aids, or takes the greater part in the erection of the spines on the backs of some of the lower animals. Contraction of the platysma myoides muscle. This muscle is spread over the sides of the neck, extending downwards to a little beneath the collarbones and upwards to the lower part of the cheeks. A portion called the risorius is represented in the woodcut. The contraction of this muscle draws the corners of the mouth and the lower parts of the cheeks downwards and backwards. It produces at the same time divergent longitudinal prominent ridges on the sides of the neck in the young, and in old thin persons, fine transverse wrinkles. This muscle is sometimes said not to be under the control of the will, but almost every one, if told to draw the corners of his mouth backwards and downwards with great force, brings it into action. I have, however, heard of a man who can voluntarily act on it only on one side of his neck. Sir C. Bell and others have stated that this muscle is strongly contracted under the influence of fear, and Duchesne insists so strongly on its importance in the expression of this emotion that he calls it the muscle of fright. He admits, however, that its contraction is quite inexpressive unless associated with widely open eyes and mouth. He has given a photograph, copied and reduced in the accompanying woodcut, of the same old man as on former occasions, with his eyebrows strongly raised, his mouth opened, and the platysma contracted, all by means of galvanism. The original photograph was shown to 24 persons, and they were separately asked, without any explanation being given, what expression was intended. Twenty instantly answered intense fright or horror. Three said pain and one extreme discomfort. Dr. Duchesne has given another photograph of the same old man with the platysma contracted, the eyes and mouth opened, and the eyebrows rendered oblique by means of galvanism. The expression thus induced is very striking, the obliquity of the eyebrows adding the appearance of great mental distress. The original was shown to 15 persons, 12 answered terror or horror, and 3 agony or great suffering. From these cases and from an examination of the other photographs given by Dr. Duchesne, together with his remarks thereon, I think there can be little doubt that the contraction of the platysma does add greatly to the expression of fear. Nevertheless, this muscle ought hardly to be called that of fright, for its contraction is certainly not a necessary concomitant of this state of mind. A man may exhibit extreme terror in the plainest manner by death-like power, by drops of perspiration on his skin, and by utter prostration with all the muscles of his body, including the platysma, completely relaxed. Although Dr. Brown has often seen this muscle quivering and contracting in the insane, he has not been able to connect its action with any emotional condition in them. Though he carefully attended to patients suffering from great fear, Mr. Nicole, on the other hand, has observed three cases in which this muscle appeared to be more or less permanently contracted under the influence of melancholia, associated with much dread, 
but in one of these cases, various other muscles about the neck and head were subject to spasmodic contractions. Dr. W. Ogle observed for me in one of the London hospitals about 20 patients just before they were put under the influence of chloroform for operations. They exhibited some trepidation, but no great terror. In only four of the cases was the platysma visibly contracted, and it did not begin to contract until the patients began to cry. The muscles seemed to contract at the moment of each deep-drawn inspiration, so that it is very doubtful whether the contraction depended at all on the emotion of fear. In a fifth case, the patient who was not chloroformed was much terrified, and his platysma was more forcibly and persistently contracted than in the other cases. But even here there is room for doubt, for the muscle, which appeared to be unusually developed, was seen by Dr. Ogle to contract as the man moved his head from the pillow after the operation was over. As I felt much perplexed why, in any case, a superficial muscle on the neck should be especially affected by fear, I applied to my many obliging correspondents for information about the contraction of this muscle under other circumstances. It would be superfluous to give all the answers which I have received. They show that this muscle acts, often in a variable manner and degree, under many different conditions. It is violently contracted in hydrophobia and in a somewhat less degree in lockjaw, sometimes in a marked manner during the insensibility from chloroform. Dr. W. Ogle observed two male patients suffering from such difficulty in breathing that the trachea had to be opened, and in both the platysma was strongly contracted. One of these men overheard the conversation of the surgeons surrounding him, and when he was able to speak, declared that he had not been frightened. In some other cases of extreme difficulty of respiration, though not requiring tracheotomy, observed by doctors Ogle and Langstaff, the platysma was not contracted. Mr. J. Wood, who has studied with such care the muscles of the human body, as shown by his various publications, has often seen the platysma contracting in vomiting, nausea, and disgust, also in children and adults under the influence of rage, for instance, in Irish women, quarreling and brawling together with angry gesticulations. This may possibly have been due to their high and angry tones, for I know a lady, an excellent musician, who, in singing certain high notes, always contracts her platysma. So does a young man, as I have observed, in sounding certain notes on the flute. Mr. J. Wood informs me that he has found the platysma best developed in persons with thick necks and broad shoulders, and that in families inheriting these peculiarities, its development is usually associated with much voluntary power over the homologous occipitofrontalis muscle, by which the scalp can be moved. None of the foregoing cases appear to throw any light on the contraction of the platysma from fear, but it is different, I think, with the following cases. The gentleman before referred to who can voluntarily act on this muscle only on one side of his neck is positive that it contracts on both sides whenever he is startled. Evidence has already been given showing that this muscle sometimes contracts, perhaps for the sake of opening the mouth widely, when the breathing is rendered difficult by disease, and during the deep inspirations of crying fits before an operation. Now, whenever a person starts at any sudden sight or sound, he instantaneously draws a deep breath, and thus the contraction of the platysma may possibly have become associated with the sense of fear. But there is, I believe, a more efficient relation. The first sensation of fear or the imagination of something dreadful commonly excites a shudder. I have caught myself giving a little involuntary shudder at a painful thought, and I distinctly perceived that my platysma contracted. So it does if I simulate a shudder. I have asked others to act in this manner, and in some the muscle contracted, but not in others. 
one of my sons, whilst getting out of bed, shuddered from the cold, and as he happened to have his hand on his neck, he plainly felt that this muscle strongly contracted. He then voluntarily shuddered, as he had done on former occasions, but the platysma was not then affected. Mr. J. Wood has also several times observed this muscle contracting in patients when stripped for examination and who were not frightened but shivered slightly from the cold. Unfortunately, I have not been able to ascertain whether, when the whole body shakes, as in the cold stage of an ague fit, the platysma contracts. But as it certainly often contracts during a shudder, and as a shudder or shiver often accompanies the first sensation of fear, we have, I think, a clue to its action in this latter case. Its contraction, however, is not an invariable concomitant of fear, for it probably never acts under the influence of extreme prostrating terror. Dilation of the pupils. Gratiolet repeatedly insists that the pupils are enormously dilated whenever terror is felt. I have no reason to doubt the accuracy of this statement, but have failed to obtain confirmatory evidence, excepting in the one instance before given of an insane woman suffering from great fear. When writers of fiction speak of the eyes being widely dilated, I presume that they refer to the eyelids. Monroe's statement that with parrots the iris is affected by the passions, independently of the amount of light, seems to bear on this question. But Professor Donders informs me that he has often seen movements in the pupils of these birds which he thinks may be related to their power of accommodation to distance, in nearly the same manner as our own pupils contract when our eyes converge for near vision. Gratiolet remarks that the dilated pupils appear as if they were gazing into profound darkness. No doubt the fears of man have often been excited in the dark, but hardly so often or so exclusively as to account for a fixed and associated habit having thus arisen. It seems more probable, assuming that Gratiolet's statement is correct, that the brain is directly affected by the powerful emotion of fear and reacts on the pupils. But Professor Donders informs me that this is an extremely complicated subject. I may add, as possibly throwing light on the subject, that Dr. Fife of Netley Hospital has observed in two patients that the pupils were distinctly dilated during the cold stage of an ague fit. Professor Donders has also seen dilation of the pupils in incipient faintness. Horror. The state of mind expressed by this term implies terror, and is in some cases almost synonymous with it. Many a man must have felt, before the blessed discovery of chloroform, great horror at the thought of an impending surgical operation. He who dreads, as well as hates a man, will feel, as Milton uses the word, a horror of him. We feel horror if we see any one, for instance a child, exposed to to some instant and crushing danger. Almost everyone would experience the same feeling in the highest degree in witnessing a man being tortured or going to be tortured. In these cases, there is no danger to ourselves, but from the power of the imagination and of sympathy, we put ourselves in the position of the sufferer and feel something akin to fear. Sir C. Bell remarks that Horror is full of energy. The body is in the utmost tension, not unnerved by fear. It is therefore probable that horror would generally be accompanied by the strong contraction of the brows. But as fear is one of the elements, the eyes and mouth would be opened and the eyebrows would be raised, as far as the antagonistic action of the corrugators permitted this movement. Duchesne has given a photograph of the same old man as before, with his eyes somewhat staring, the eyebrows partially raised, and at the same time strongly contracted, the mouth opened, and the platysma in action, all affected by the means of galvanism. He considers that the expression thus produced 
shows extreme terror with horrible pain or torture. A tortured man, as long as his sufferings allow him to feel any dread for the future, would probably exhibit horror in an extreme degree. I have shown the original of this photograph to 23 persons of both sexes and various ages, and 13 immediately answered horror, great pain, torture, or agony. Three answered extreme fright, so that 16 answered nearly in accordance with Duchenne's belief. Six, however, said anger, guided no doubt by the strongly contracted brows, and overlooking the peculiarly open mouth. One said disgust. On the whole, the evidence indicates that we have here a fairly good representation of horror and agony. The photograph before referred to likewise exhibits horror, but in this, the oblique eyebrows indicate great mental distress in place of energy. Horror is generally accompanied by various gestures which differ in different individuals. Judging from pictures, the whole body is often turned away or shrinks, or the arms are violently protruded as if to push away some dreadful object. The most frequent gesture, as far as can be inferred from the action of persons who endeavor to express a vividly imagined scene of horror, is the raising of both shoulders, with the bent arms pressed closely against the sides or chest. These movements are nearly the same with those commonly made when we feel very cold, and they are generally accompanied by a shudder, as well as a deep expiration or inspiration, according as the chest happens at the time to be expanded or contracted. The sounds thus made are expressed by words like uh or ugh. It is not, however, obvious why, when we feel cold or express a sense of horror, we press our bent arms against our bodies, raise our shoulders, and shudder. Conclusion I have now endeavored to describe the diversified expressions of fear, in its gradations from mere attention to a start of surprise, into extreme terror and horror. Some of the signs may be accounted for through the principles of habit, association, and inheritance, such as the wide opening of the mouth and eyes with upraised eyebrows, so as to see as quickly as possible all around us and to hear distinctly whatever sound may reach our ears. For we have thus habitually prepared ourselves to discover and encounter any danger. Some of the other signs of fear may likewise be accounted for, at least in part, through these same principles. Men, during numberless generations, have endeavored to escape from their enemies or danger by headlong flight, or by violently struggling with them, and such great exertions will have caused the heart to beat rapidly, the breathing to be hurried, the chest to heave, and the nostrils to be dilated. As these exertions have often been prolonged to the last extremity, the final result will have been utter prostration, pallor, perspiration, trembling of all the muscles, or their complete relaxation. And now, whenever the emotion of fear is strongly felt, though it may not lead to any exertion, the same results tend to reappear through the force of inheritance and association. Nevertheless, it is probable that many or most of the above symptoms of terror, such as the beating of the heart, the trembling of the muscles, cold perspiration, etc., are in large part directly due to the disturbed or interrupted transmission of nerve force from the cerebrospinal system to various parts of the body, owing to the mind being so powerfully affected. We may confidently look to this cause, independently of habit and association, in such cases as the modified secretions of the intestinal canal and the failure of certain glands to act. With respect to the involuntary bristling of the hair, we have good reason to believe that in the case of animals this action, however it may have originated, serves, together with certain voluntary movements, to make them appear terrible to their enemies. And as the same involuntary and voluntary actions are performed by animals nearly related to man, 
we are led to believe that man has retained through inheritance a relic of them, now become useless. It is certainly a remarkable fact that the minute, unstriped muscles by which the hairs thinly scattered over a man's almost naked body are erected should have been preserved to the present day, and that they should still contract under the same emotions, namely terror and rage, which cause the hairs to stand on end in the lower members of the order to which man belongs. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 13 Self Attention. Shame shyness modesty blushing nature of a blush inheritance the parts of the body most affected blushing in the various races of man accompanying gestures confusion of mind causes of blushing self-attention the fundamental element shyness shame from broken moral laws and conventional rules modesty theory of blushing recapitulation blushing is the most peculiar and the most human of all expressions monkeys redden from passion but it will require an overwhelming amount of evidence to make us believe that any animal could blush the reddening of the face from a blush is due to the relaxation of the muscular coats of the small arteries by which the capillaries become filled with blood and this depends on the proper vasomotor centre being affected no doubt if there be at the same time much mental agitation the general circulation will be affected but it is not due to the action of the heart that the network of minute vessels covering the face becomes under a sense of shame gorged with blood. We can cause laughing by tickling the skin, weeping or frowning by a blow, trembling from the fear of pain, and so forth. But we cannot cause a blush, as Dr. Burgess remarks, by any physical means. That is by any action on the body. It is the mind which must be affected. Blushing is not only involuntary, but the wish to restrain it by leading to self-attention actually increases the tendency. The young blush much more freely than the old, but not during infancy, which is remarkable as we know that infants at a very early age redden from passion. I have received authentic accounts of two little girls blushing at the ages of between two and three years, and of another sensitive child, a year older, blushing when reproved for a fault. Many children at a somewhat more advanced age blush in a strongly marked manner. It appears that the mental powers of infants are not as yet sufficiently developed to allow of their blushing. Hence, also, it is that idiots rarely blush. Dr. Crichton Brown observed for me those under his care, but never saw a genuine blush, though he has seen their faces flash, apparently from joy, when food was placed before them, and from anger. Nevertheless, some, if not utterly degraded, are capable of blushing. A microcephalous idiot, for instance, thirteen years old, whose eyes brightened a little when he was pleased or amused, has been described by Dr. Ben as blushing and turning to one side when undressed for medical examination. Women blush much more than men. It is rare to see an old man, but not nearly so rare to see an old woman blushing. The blind do not escape. Laura Bridgman, born in this condition, as well as completely deaf, blushes. 
the rev r h blair principal of the worcester college informs me that three children born blind out of seven or eight then in the asylum are great blushers the blind are not at first conscious that they are observed and it is the most important part of their education as mr blair informs me to impress this knowledge on their minds and the impression thus gained would greatly strengthen the tendency to blush by increasing the habit of self-attention the tendency to blush is inherited dr burgess gives the case of a family consisting of a father mother and ten children all of whom without exception were prone to blush to a most painful degree the children were grown up and some of them were sent to travel in order to wear away this diseased sensibility but nothing was of the slightest avail even peculiarities in blushing seemed to be inherited sir james paget whilst examining the spine of a girl was struck at her singular manner of blushing a big splash of red appeared first on one cheek and then other splashes variously scattered over the face and neck he subsequently asked the mother whether her daughter always blushed in this peculiar manner and was answered yes she takes after me sir j paget then perceived that by asking this question he had caused the mother to blush and she exhibited the same peculiarity as her daughter in most cases the face ears and neck are the sole parts which redden but many persons whilst blushing intensely feel that their whole bodies grow hot and tingle and this shows that the entire surface must be in some manner affected blushes are said sometimes to commence on the forehead but more commonly on the cheeks afterwards spreading to the ears and neck in two albinos examined by dr burgess the blushes commenced by a small circumscribed spot on the cheeks over the parotidian plexus of nerves and then increased into a circle between this blushing circle and the blush on the neck there was an evident line of demarcation although both arose simultaneously the retina which is naturally red in the albino invariably increased at the same time in redness every one must have noticed how easily after one blush fresh blushes chase each other over the face blushing is preceded by a peculiar sensation in the skin according to dr burgess the reddening of the skin is generally succeeded by a slight pallor which shows that the capillary vessels contract after dilating in some rare cases paleness instead of redness is caused under conditions which would naturally induce a blush for instance a young lady told me that in a large and crowded party she caught her hair so firmly on the button of a passing servant that it took some time before she could be extricated from her sensations she imagined that she had blushed crimson but was assured by a friend that she had turned extremely pale i was desirous to learn how far down the body blushes extend and sir j paget who necessarily has frequent opportunities for observation has kindly attended to this point for me during two or three years he finds that with women who blush intensely on the face ears and nape of neck the blush does not commonly extend any lower down the body it is rare to see it as low down as the collar bones and shoulder blades and he has never himself seen a single instance in which it extended below the upper part of the chest he has also noticed that blushes sometimes die away downwards not gradually and insensibly but by irregular ruddy blotches dr langstaff has likewise observed for me several women whose bodies did not in the least redden while their faces were crimsoned with blushes with the insane some of whom appear to be particularly liable to blushing 
Dr. J. Crichton Brown has several times seen the blush extend as far down as the collar bones, and in two instances to the breast. He gives me the case of a married woman, aged 27, who suffered from epilepsy. On the morning after her arrival in the asylum, Dr. Brown, together with his assistants, visited her while she was in bed. The moment that he approached, she blushed deeply over her cheeks and temples, and the blush spread quickly to her ears. She was much agitated and tremulous. He unfastened the collar of her chemise in order to examine the state of her lungs, and then a brilliant blush rushed over her chest in an arch line over the upper third of each breast, and extended downwards between the breasts nearly to the ensiform cartilage of the sternum. This case is interesting, as the blush did not thus extend downwards until it became intense by her attention being drawn to this part of her person. As the examination proceeded, she became composed, and the blush disappeared. But on several subsequent occasions, the same phenomena were observed. The foregoing facts show that, as a general rule, with English women, blushing does not extend beneath the neck and upper part of the chest. Nevertheless, Sir J. Paget informs me that he has lately heard of a case on which he can fully rely in which a little girl, shocked by what she imagined to be an act of indelicacy, blushed all over her abdomen and the upper parts of her legs. Moreau also relates on the authority of a celebrated painter that the chest, shoulders, arms, and whole body of a girl who unwillingly consented to serve as a model reddened when she was first divested of her clothes. It is a rather curious question why, in most cases, the face, ears, and neck alone redden, inasmuch as the whole surface of the body often tingles and grows hot. It seems to depend chiefly on the face and adjoining parts of the skin having been habitually exposed to the air, light, and alternations of temperature, by which the small arteries not only have acquired the habit of readily dilating and contracting, but appear to have unusually developed in comparison with other parts of the surface. It is probably owing to the same cause as Monsieur Moreau and Dr. Burgess have remarked, that the face is so liable to redden under various circumstances, such as fever fit, ordinary heat, violent exertion, anger, a slight blow, etc. And on the other hand, that it is liable to grow pale from cold and fear, and to be discolored during pregnancy. The face is also particularly liable to be affected by cutaneous complaints, by smallpox, erysipelas, etc. This view is likewise supported by the fact that the men of certain races who habitually go nearly naked often blush over their arms and chests and even down to their waists. A lady, who is a great blusher, informs Dr. Crichton Brown that when she feels ashamed or is agitated, she blushes over her face, neck, wrists, and hands, that is, over all the exposed portions of her skin. Nevertheless, it may be doubted whether the habitual exposure of the skin, of the face and neck, and its consequent power of reaction under stimulants of all kinds, is by itself sufficient to account for the much greater tendency in English women of these parts than of others to blush. For the hands are well supplied with nerves and small vessels, and have been as much exposed to the air as the face or neck and yet the hands rarely blush. We shall presently see that the attention of the mind having been directed much more frequently and earnestly to the face than to any other part of the body probably affords a sufficient explanation. Blushing in the Various Races of Man The small vessels of the face become filled with blood from the emotion of shame in almost all the races of man though in the very dark races no distinct change of color can be perceived. Blushing is evident in all the Aryan nations of Europe, and to a certain extent with those of India. But Mr. Erskine has never noticed that the necks of the Hindus are decidedly affected. 
with the lepchas of sikkim mr scott has often observed a faint blush on the cheeks base of the ears and sides of the neck accompanied by sunken eyes and lowered head this has occurred when he has detected them in a falsehood or has accused them of ingratitude the pale sallow complexions of these men render a blush much more conspicuous than in most of the other natives of india with the latter shame or it may be in part fear is expressed according to mr scott much more plainly by the head being averted or bent down with the eyes wavering or turned askant than by any change of color in the skin the semitic races blush freely as might have been expected from their general similitude to the aryans thus with the jews it is said in the book of jeremiah chapter six fifteen nay they were not at all ashamed neither could they blush mrs asa gray saw an arab managing his boat clumsily on the nile and when laughed at by his companions he blushed quite to the back of his neck lady duff gordon remarks that a young arab blushed on coming into her presence mr swinhoe has seen the chinese blushing but he thinks it is rare yet they have the expression to redden with shame mr keech informs me that the chinese settled in malacca and the native malays of the interior both blush some of these people go nearly naked and he particularly attended to the downward extension of the blush omitting the cases in which the face alone was seen to blush mr geech observed that the face arms and breasts of a chinaman aged twenty-four years reddened from shame and with another chinese when asked why he had not done his work in better style the whole body was similarly affected in two malays he saw the face neck breast and arms blushing and in a third malay a bugis the blush extended down to the waist the polynesians blush freely the reverend mr stack has seen hundreds of instances with the new zealanders the following case is worth giving as it relates to an old man who was unusually dark-coloured and partly tattooed after having let his land to an englishman for a small yearly rental a strong passion seized him to buy a gig which had lately become the fashion with the maoris he consequently wished to draw all the rent for four years from his tenant and consulted mr stack whether he could do so the man was old clumsy poor and ragged and the idea of his driving himself about in his carriage for display amused mr stack so much that he could not help bursting out into a laugh and then the old man blushed up to the roots of his hair forster says that you may easily distinguish a spreading blush on the cheeks of the fairest women in tahiti the natives also of several of the other archipelagos in the pacific have been seen to blush mr washington matthews has often seen a blush on the faces of the young squalls belonging to various wild indian tribes of north america at the opposite extremity of the continent in tierra del fuego the natives according to mr bridges blush much but chiefly in regard to women but they certainly blush also at their own personal appearance this latter statement agrees with what i remember of the fusion jemmy button who blushed when he was quizzed about the care which he took in polishing his shoes and in otherwise adorning himself with respect to the aymara indians on the lofty plateaus of bolivia mr forbes say that from the colour of their skins it is impossible that their blushes should be as clearly visible as in the white races still under such circumstances as would raise a blush in us there can always be seen the same expression of modesty or confusion and even in the dark a rise of temperature of the skin of the face can be felt exactly as occurs in the european with the indians who inhabit the hot equable and damp parts of south america the skin apparently does not answer to mental excitement so readily as with the natives of the northern and southern parts of the continent who have long been exposed to great vicissitudes of climate for humboldt 
quotes without a protest the sneer of the Spaniard. How can those be trusted who know not how to blush? Von Spix and Martius, in speaking of the aborigines of Brazil, assert that they cannot properly be said to blush. It was only after long intercourse with the whites, and after receiving some education, that we perceived in the Indians a change of color expressive of the emotions of their minds. It is, however, incredible that the power of blushing could have thus originated. But the habit of self-attention, consequent on their education and new course of life, would have much increased any innate tendency to blush. Several trustworthy observers have assured me that they have seen on the faces of negroes an appearance resembling a blush, under circumstances which would have excited one in us, though their skins were of an ebony black tint. Some describe it as blushing brown, but most say that the blackness becomes more intense. An increased supply of blood in the skin seems in some manner to increase its blackness. Thus, certain exanthematous diseases cause the affected places in the negro to appear blacker, instead of, as with us, redder. The skin, perhaps from being rendered more tense by the filling of the capillaries, would reflect a somewhat different tint to what it did before. That the capillaries of the face in the negro become filled with blood, under the emotion of shame, we may feel confident, because a perfectly characterized albino negress, described by Buffon, showed a faint tinge of crimson on her cheeks when she exhibited herself naked cicatrices of the skin remained for a long time white in the negro and dr burgess who had frequent opportunities of observing a scar of this kind on the face of a negress distinctly saw that it invariably became red whenever she was abruptly spoken to or charged with any trivial offence the blush could be seen proceeding from the circumference of the scar towards the middle but it did not reach the centre Mulattoes are often great blushers, blush succeeding blush over their faces. From these facts there can be no doubt that negroes blush, although no redness is visible on the skin. I am assured by Gaika and by Mrs. Barber that the Kaffirs of South Africa never blush, but this may only mean that no change of color is distinguishable. Gaika adds that under the circumstances which would make a European blush, his countrymen looked ashamed to keep their heads up. It is asserted by four of my informants that the Australians, who are almost as black as Negroes, never blush. A fifth answered doubtfully, remarking that only a very strong blush could be seen on account of the dirty state of their skins. Three observers state that they do blush. Mr. S. Wilson adding that this is noticeable only under a strong emotion, and when the skin is not too dark from long exposure and want of cleanliness. Mr. Lang answers, I have noticed that shame almost always excites a blush, which frequently extends as low as the neck. Shame is also shown, as he adds, by the eyes being turned from side to side. As Mr. Lang was a teacher in a native school, it is probable that he chiefly observed children, and we know that they blush more than adults. Mr. G. Taplin has seen half-caste blushing, and he says that the aborigines have a word expressive of shame. Mr. hagen who is one of those who has never observed the Australians to blush, says that he has seen them looking down to the ground on account of shame. And the missionary, Mr. Bulmer, remarks that though I have not been able to detect anything like shame in the adult aborigines, I have noticed that the eyes of the children, when ashamed, present a restless, watery appearance, as if they did not know where to look. The facts now given are sufficient to show that blushing, whether or not there is any change of color, is common to most, probably to all, of the races of man movements and gestures which accompany blushing 
Under a keen sense of shame, there is a strong desire for concealment. We turn away the whole body, more especially the face, which we endeavor in some manner to hide. An ashamed person can hardly endure to meet the gaze of those present, so that he almost invariably casts down his eye or look askant. As there generally exists at the same time a strong wish to avoid the appearance of shame, a vain attempt is made to look direct at the person who causes this feeling, and the antagonism between these opposite tendencies lead to various restless movements in the eyes. I have noticed two ladies who, whilst blushing, to which they are very liable, have thus acquired, as it appears, the oddest trick of incessantly blinking their eyelids with extraordinary rapidity. An intense blush is sometimes accompanied by a slight effusion of tears. And this, I presume, is due to the lacrimal glands partaking of the increased supply of blood, which we know rushes into the capillaries of the adjoining parts, including the retina. Many writers, ancient and modern, have noticed the foregoing movements, and it has already been shown that the aborigines in various parts of the world often exhibit their shame by looking downwards, or asking, or by restless movements of their eyes. Ezra cries out, Chapter 9, 6 O oh my God, I am ashamed, and blush to lift up my head to thee, my God. In Isaiah, Chapter 1, 6, we meet with the words, I hid not my face from shame. Seneca remarks, Epistle 11, 5, that the Roman players hang down their heads, fix their eyes on the ground, and keep them lowered, but are unable to blush in acting shame. According to Macrobius, who lived in the 5th century, Saturnalia, B, 7, C, 11, Natural philosophers assert that nature, being moved by shame, spreads the blood before herself as a veil, as we see any one blushing often put his hands before his face. Shakespeare makes Marcus, Titus Andronicus, Act 2, Scene 5, say to his knees, Ah, now thou turns away thy face for shame. A lady informs me that she found in the Locke Hospital a girl whom she had formerly known and who had become a wretched castaway, and the poor creature, when approached, hid her face under the bedclothes and could not be persuaded to uncover it. We often see little children, when shy or ashamed, turn away and, still standing up, bury their faces in their mother's gown, or they throw themselves face downwards on her lap. End of section 23section 24 of the expression of the emotions in man and animals this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by hannah lynn the expression of the emotions in man and animals by charles darwin Chapter 13. Self-attention, shame, shyness, modesty, blushing, continued. Part 2. Confusion of mind. Most persons, whilst blushing intensely, have their mental powers confused. This is recognized in such common expressions as, she was covered with confusion. Persons in this condition lose their presence of mind and utter singularly inappropriate remarks. They are often much distressed, stammer, and make awkward movements or strange grimaces. In certain cases, involuntarily twitchings of some of the facial muscles may be observed. I have been informed by a young lady, who blushes excessively, that at such times she does not even know what she is saying. When it was suggested to her that this might be due to her distress from the consciousness that her blushing was noticed, she answered that this could not be the case as she had sometimes felt quite as stupid when blushing at a thought in her own room. I will give an instance of the extreme disturbance of mind to which some sensitive men are liable. A gentleman, on whom I can rely, assured me that he had been an eyewitness of the following scene. 
a small dinner party was given in honor of an extremely shy man who when he rose to return thanks rehearsed the speech which he had evidently learned by heart in absolute silence and did not utter a single word but he acted as if he were speaking with much emphasis his friends perceiving how the case stood loudly applauded the imaginary burst of eloquence whenever his gestures indicated a pause and the man never discovered that he had remained the whole time completely silent on the contrary he afterwards remarked to my friend with much satisfaction that he thought he had succeeded uncommonly well when a person is much ashamed or very shy and blushes intensely his heart beats rapidly and his breathing is disturbed this can hardly fail to affect the circulation of the blood within the brain and perhaps the mental powers it seems however doubtful judging from the still more powerful influence of anger and fear on the circulation whether we can thus satisfactorily account for the confused state of mind in persons whilst blushing intensely the true explanation apparently lies in the intimate sympathy which exists between the capillary circulation of the surface of the head and face and that of the brain on applying to dr j crichton brown for information he has given me various facts bearing on this subject when the sympathetic nerve is divided on one side of the head the capillaries on this side are relaxed and become filled with blood causing the skin to redden and grow hot and at the same time the temperature within the cranium on the same side rises inflammation of the membranes of the brain leads to the engorgement of the face ears and eyes with blood the first stage of an epileptic fit appears to be the contraction of the vessels of the brain and the first outward manifestation is an extreme pallor of countenance erysipelas of the head commonly induces delirium even the relief given to a severe headache by burning the skin with strong lotion depends i presume on the same principle dr brown has often administered to his patients the vapor of the nitrite of amyl which has the singular property of causing vivid redness of the face in from thirty to sixty seconds this flushing resembles blushing in almost every detail it begins at several distinct points on the face and spreads till it involves the whole surface of the head neck and front of the chest but has been observed to extend only in one case to the abdomen the arteries in the retina becomes enlarged the eyes glisten and in one instance there was a slight effusion of tears the patients are at first pleasantly stimulated but as the flushing increases they become confused and bewildered one woman to whom the vapor had often been administered asserted that as soon as she grew hot she grew muddled with persons just commencing to blush it appears judging from their bright eyes and lively behavior that their mental powers are somewhat stimulated it is only when the blushing is excessive that the mind grows confused therefore it would seem that the capillaries of the face are affected both during the inhalation of the nitrite of amyl and during blushing before that part of the brain is affected on which the mental powers depend conversely when the brain is primarily affected the circulation of the skin is so in a secondary manner dr brown has frequently observed as he informs me scattered red blotches and mottlings on the chest of epileptic patients in these cases when the skin on the thorax or abdomen is gently rubbed with a pencil or other object or in strongly marked cases is merely touched by the finger the surface becomes suffused in less than half a minute with bright red marks which spread to some distance on each side of the touched point and persists for several minutes these are the cerebral maculae of trousseau and they indicate as dr brown remarks a highly modified condition of the cutaneous vascular system if then there exist as cannot be doubted an intimate sympathy between the capillary circulation in that part of the brain on which our mental powers depend and in the skin of the face it is not surprising that the moral causes which induce intense blushing should likewise induce independently of their own disturbing influence much confusion of mind the nature of the mental states which induce blushing 
These consist of shyness, shame, and modesty. The essential element in all being self-attention. Many reasons can be assigned for believing that originally self-attention directed to personal appearance, in relation to the opinion of others, was the exciting cause. The same effect being subsequently produced through the force of association by self-attention in relation to moral conduct. It is not the simple act of reflecting on our own appearance, but the thinking what others think of us, which excites a blush. In absolute solitude, the most sensitive person would be quite indifferent about his appearance. We feel blame or disapprobation more acutely than approbation, and consequently depreciatory remarks or ridicule, whether our appearance or conduct causes us to blush much more readily than does praise. But undoubtedly, praise and admiration are highly efficient. A pretty girl blushes when a man gazes intently at her, though she may know perfectly well that he is not depreciating her. Many children, as well as old and sensitive persons, blush when they are much praised. Hereafter, the question will be discussed how it has arisen that the consciousness that others are attending to our personal appearance should have led to the capillaries. Especially those of the face, instantly becoming filled with blood. My reasons for believing that attention directed to personal appearance and not to moral conduct has been the fundamental element in the acquirement of the habit of blushing will now be given. They are separately light, but combined possesses, as it appears to me, considerable weight. It is notorious that nothing makes a shy person blush so much as any remark, however slight, on his personal appearance. One cannot notice even the dress of a woman much given to blushing without causing her face to crimson. It is sufficient to stare hard at some person to make them, as Coleridge remarks, blush. Account for that he who can. With the two albinos observed by Doctor Burgess. The slightest attempt to examine their peculiarities invariably caused them to blush deeply. Women are much more sensitive about their personal appearance than men are, especially elderly women in comparison with elderly men, and they blush much more freely. The young of both sexes are much more sensitive on the same head than the old, and they also blush much more freely than the old. Children at a very early age do not blush. Nor do they show those other signs of self-consciousness which generally accompany blushing, and it is one of their chief charms that they think nothing about what others think of them. At this early age, they will stare at a stranger with a fixed gaze and unblinking eyes, as on an inanimate object, in a manner which we elders cannot imitate. It is plain to every one that young men and women are highly sensitive to the opinion of each other. With reference to their personal appearance, and they blush incomparably more in the presence of the opposite sex than in that of their own. A young man not very liable to blush will blush intensely at any slight ridicule of his appearance from a girl whose judgment on any important subject lie with disregard. No happy pair of young lovers, valuing each other's admiration and love more than anything else in the world, probably ever courted each other without many a blush. Even the barbarians of Tierra del Fuego, according to Mr. Bridges, blush chiefly in regard to women, but certainly also at their own personal appearance. Of all parts of the body, the face is most considered and regarded, as is natural from its being the chief seat of expression and the source of the voice. It is also the chief seat of beauty and of ugliness, and throughout the world is the most ornamented. The face, therefore, will have been subjected during many generations to much closer and more earnest self-attention than any other part of the body, and in accordance with the principle here advanced, we can understand why it should be the most liable to blush, although exposure to alternations of temperature and etc. has probably much increased the power of dilatation and contraction in the capillaries of the face and adjoining parts. Yet this by itself will hardly account for these parts blushing much more than the rest of the body, for it does not explain the fact of the hands rarely blushing. 
With Europeans, the whole body tingles slightly when the face blushes intensely, and with the races of men who habitually go nearly naked, the blushes extend over a much larger surface than with us. These facts are, to a certain extent, intelligible, as the self-attention of primeval man, as well as of the existing races which still go naked, will not have been so exclusively confined to their faces, as is the case with the people who now go clothed. We have seen that in all parts of the world, persons who feel shame for some moral delinquency are apt to avert, bend down, or hide their faces, independently of any thought about their personal appearance. The object can hardly be to conceal their blushes, for the face is thus averted or hidden under circumstances which exclude any desire to conceal shame, as when guilt is fully confessed and repented of. It is, however, probable that primeval man, before he had acquired much moral sensitiveness, would have been highly sensitive about his personal appearance, at least in reference to the other sex, and he would consequently have felt distress at any depreciatory remarks about his appearance. And this is one form of shame. And as the face is the part of the body which is most regarded, it is intelligible that any one ashamed of his personal appearance would desire to conceal this part of his body. The habit, having been thus acquired, would naturally be carried on when shame from strictly moral causes was felt, and it is not easy otherwise to see why under these circumstances there should be a desire to hide the face more than any other part of the body. The habit, so general with everyone who feels ashamed of turning away or lowering his eyes or restlessly moving them from side to side, probably follows from each glance directed towards those present, bringing home the conviction that he is intently regarded. And he endeavors, by not looking at those present, and especially not at their eyes, momentarily to escape from this painful conviction. Shyness. This odd state of mind, often called shamefacedness, or false shame, or mauvaise honte, appears to be one of the most efficient of all the causes of blushing. Shyness is, indeed, chiefly recognized by the face reddening, by the eyes being averted or cast down, and by awkward nervous movements of the body. Many a woman blushes from this cause a hundred, perhaps a thousand times, to once that she blushes from having done anything deserving blame, and of which she is truly ashamed. Shyness seems to depend on sensitiveness to the opinion, whether good or bad, of others, more especially with respect to external appearance. Strangers neither know nor care anything about our conduct or character, but they may, and often do, criticize our appearance. Hence shy persons are particularly apt to be shy and to blush in the presence of strangers. The consciousness of anything peculiar, or even new, in the dress, or any slight blemish on the person, and more especially on the face, points which are likely to attract the attention of strangers, makes the shy intolerably shy. On the other hand, in those cases in which conduct and not personal appearance is concerned, we are much more apt to be shy in the presence of acquaintances, whose judgment we in some degree value, than in that of strangers. A physician told me that a young man, a wealthy duke, with whom he had travelled as medical attendant, blushed like a girl when he paid him his fee. Yet this young man probably would not have blushed and been shy had he been paying a bill to a tradesman. Some persons, however, are so sensitive that the mere act of speaking to almost anyone is sufficient to rouse their self-consciousness, and a slight blush is the result. This approbation or ridicule, from our sensitiveness on this head, causes shyness and blushing much more readily than this approbation, though the latter with some persons is highly efficient. The conceited are rarely shy, for they value themselves much too highly to expect depreciation. Why a proud man is often shy, as appears to be the case, is not so obvious, unless it be that, with all his self-reliance, he really thinks much about the opinion of others, although in a disdainful spirit. 
Persons who are exceedingly shy are rarely shy in the presence of those with whom they are quite familiar, and of whose good opinion and sympathy they are perfectly assured. For instance, a girl in the presence of her mother. I neglected to inquire in my printed paper whether shyness can be detected in the different races of man, but a Hindu gentleman assured Mr. Erskine that it is recognizable in his countrymen. Shyness, as the derivation of the word indicates in several languages, is closely related to fear. Yet it is distinct from fear in the ordinary sense. A shy man no doubt dreads the notice of strangers, but can hardly be said to be afraid of them. He may be as bold as a hero in battle, and yet have no self-confidence about trifles in the presence of strangers. Almost every one is extremely nervous when first addressing a public assembly, and most men remain so throughout their lives. But this appears to depend on the consciousness of a great coming exertion, with its associated effects on the system, rather than on shyness. Although a timid or shy man no doubt suffers on such occasions indefinitely more than another. With very young children, it is difficult to distinguish between fear and shyness, but this latter feeling with them has often seemed to me to partake of the character of the wildness of an untamed animal. Shyness comes on at a very early age. In one of my own children, when two years and three months old, I saw a trace of what certainly appeared to be shyness directed towards myself after an absence from home of only a week. This was shown not only by a blush, but by the eyes being for a few minutes slightly averted from me. I have noticed on other occasions that shyness or shamefacedness and real shame are exhibited in the eyes of young children before they have acquired the power of blushing. As shyness apparently depends on self-attention, we can perceive how right are those who maintain that reprehending children for shyness instead of doing them any good does much harm as it calls their attention still more closely to themselves. It has been well urged that nothing hurts young people more than to be watched continually about their feelings, to have their countenances scrutinized, and the degrees of their sensibility measured by the surveying eye of the unmerciful spectator. Under the constraint of such examinations, they can think of nothing but that they are looked at, and feel nothing but shame or apprehension. Moral causes, guilt. With respect to blushing from strictly moral causes, we meet with the same fundamental principle as before, namely, regard for the opinion of others. It is not the conscience which raises a blush, for a man may sincerely regret some slight fault committed in solitude, or he may suffer the deepest remorse for an undetected crime, but he will not blush. I blush, says Dr. Burgess, in the presence of my accusers. It is not the sense of guilt, but the thought that others think or know us to be guilty, which crimsons the face. A man may feel thoroughly ashamed at having told a small falsehood without blushing, but if he even suspects that he is detected, he will instantly blush, especially if detected by one whom he reveres. On the other hand, a man may be convinced that God witnesses all his actions, and he may feel deeply conscious of some fault and pray for forgiveness, but this will not, as a lady who is a great blusher believes, ever excite a blush. The explanation of this difference between the knowledge by God and man of her action lies, I presume, in man's disapprobation of immoral conduct, being somewhat akin in nature to his depreciation of our personal appearance, so that through association both lead to similar results, whereas the disapprobation of God brings up no such association. Many a person has blushed intensely when accused of some crime, though completely innocent of it. Even the thought, as the lady before referred to has observed to me, that others think that we have made an unkind or stupid remark is amply sufficient to cause a blush, although we know all the time that we have been completely misunderstood. 
An action may be meritorious or of an indifferent nature, but a sensitive person, if he suspects that others take a different view of it, will blush. For instance, a lady by herself may give money to a beggar without a trace of a blush, but if others are present and she doubts whether they approve or suspects that they think her influenced by display, she will blush. So it will be if she offers to relieve the distress of a decayed gentlewoman, more particularly of one whom she had previously known under better circumstances, as she cannot then feel sure how her conduct will be viewed. But such cases as these blend into shyness. Breaches of Etiquette The rules of etiquette always refers to conduct in the presence of or towards others. They have no necessary connection with the moral sense and are often meaningless. Nevertheless, as they depend on the fixed custom of our equals and superiors, whose opinion we highly regard, they are considered almost as binding as are the laws of honor to a gentleman. Consequently, the breach of the laws of etiquette, that is, any impoliteness or gaucherie, any impropriety, or an inappropriate remark, though quite accidental, will cause the most intense blushing of which a man is capable. Even the recollection of such an act, after an interval of many years, will make the whole body to tingle. So strong, also, is the power of sympathy that a sensitive person, as a lady has assured me, will sometimes blush at a flagrant breach of etiquette by a perfect stranger, though the act may in no way concern her. End of section 24「Section 25 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hannah Lynn The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin Chapter 13 Self-Attention, Shame, Shyness, Modesty, Blushing, Continued, Part 3 Modesty This is another powerful agent in exciting blushes, but the word modesty includes very different states of the mind. It implies humility, and we often judge of this by persons being greatly pleased and blushing at slight praise, or by being annoyed at praise which seems to them too high according to their own humble standard of themselves. Blushing here has the usual signification of regard for the opinion of others, but modesty frequently relates to acts of indelicacy, and indelicacy is an affair of etiquette, as we clearly see with the nations that go altogether or nearly naked. He who is modest and blushes easily at acts of this nature does so because they are breaches of a firmly and wisely established etiquette. This is indeed shown by the derivation of the word modest from modus, a measure or standard of behavior. A blush due to this form of modesty is, moreover, apt to be intense, because it generally relates to the opposite sex. And we have seen how in all cases our liability to blush is thus increased. We apply the term modest as it would appear to those who have an humble opinion of themselves and to those who are extremely sensitive about an indelicate word or deed, simply because in both cases blushes are readily excited, for those two frames of mind have nothing else in common. Shyness also, from this same cause, is often mistaken for modesty in the sense of humility. Some persons flush up, as I have observed and have been assured, at any sudden and disagreeable recollection. The commonest cause seemed to be the sudden remembrance of not having done something for another person which had been promised. In this case, it may be that the thought passes half unconsciously through the mind, what will he think of me? And then the flesh would partake of the nature of a true blush. But whether such flushes are in most cases due to the capillary circulation being affected, 
is very doubtful. For we must remember that almost every strong emotion, such as anger or great joy, acts on the heart and causes the face to redden. The fact that blushes may be excited in absolute solitude seems opposed to the view here taken, namely that the habit originally arose from thinking about what others think of us. Several ladies, who are great blushers, are unanimous in regard to solitude, and some of them believe that they have blushed in the dark. From what Mr. Forbes had stated with respect to the eye mirage, and from my own sensations, I have no doubt that this latter statement is correct. Shakespeare, therefore, erred when he made Juliet, who was not even by herself, say to Romeo, Act 2, Scene 2. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face, Else would a maiden blush be pained my cheek, For that which thou hast heard me speak to-night. But when a blush is excited in solitude, the cause almost always relates to the thoughts of others about us, to acts done in their presence, or suspected by them, or again when we reflect what others would have thought of us had they known of the act. Nevertheless, one or two of my informants believe that they have blushed from shame at acts in no way relating to others. If this be so, we must attribute the result to the force of inveterate habit and association under a state of mind closely analogous to that which ordinarily excites a blush. Nor need we feel surprise at this, as even sympathy with another person who commits a flagrant breach of etiquette is believed, as we have just seen, sometimes to cause a blush. Finally, then, I conclude that blushing, whether due to shyness, to shame for a real crime, to shame from a breach of the laws of etiquette, to modesty from humility, to modesty from an indelicacy, depends in all cases on the same principle. This principle being a sensitive regard for the opinion, more particularly for the depreciation of others, primarily in relation to our personal appearance, especially of our faces, and secondarily, through the force of association and habit, in relation to the opinion of others on our conduct. Theory of Blushing We have now to consider, why should the thought that others are thinking about us affect our capillary circulation? Sir C. Bell insists that blushing is a provision for expression, as may be inferred from the color extending only to the surface of the face, neck, and breast, the parts most exposed. It is not acquired, it is from the beginning. Dr. Burgess believes that it was designed by the Creator in order that the soul might have sovereign power of displaying in the cheeks the various internal emotions of the moral feelings, so as to serve as a check on ourselves and as a sign to others that we were violating rules which ought to be held sacred. Graciole merely remarks, well, Comme il est dans l'ordre de la nature que l'être social le plus intelligent soit aussi le plus intelligible, cette faculté de rougeur et de pâleur qui distingue l'homme est un signe naturel de sa haute perfection. The belief that blushing was specially designed by the Creator is opposed to the general theory of evolution, which is now so largely accepted. But it forms no part of my duty here to argue on the general question. Those who believe in design will find it difficult to account for shyness being the most frequent and efficient of all the causes of blushing, as it makes the blusher to suffer and the beholder uncomfortable without being of the least service to either of them. They will also find it difficult to account for Negroes and other dark-colored races blushing in whom a change of color in the skin is scarcely or not at all visible. No doubt, a slight blush adds to the beauty of a maiden's face, and the Circassian women who are capable of blushing invariably fetch a higher price in the Sarah Oleal of the Sultan than less acceptable women. 
But the firmest believer in the efficacy of sexual selection will hardly suppose that blushing was acquired as a sexual ornament. This view would also be opposed to what has just been said about the dark color races blushing in an invisible manner. The hypothesis, which appears to me the most probable, though it may at first seem rash, is that attention closely directed to any part of the body tends to interfere with the ordinary and tonic contraction of the small arteries of that part. These vessels, in consequence, become at such times more or less relaxed and are instantly filled with arterial blood. This tendency will have been much strengthened if frequent attention has been paid during many generations to the same part, owing to nerve force readily flowing along accustomed channels and by the power of inheritance. Whenever we believe that others are depreciating or even considering our personal appearance, our attention is vividly directed to the outer and visible parts of our bodies. And of all such parts, we are most sensitive about our faces, as no doubt has been the case during many past generations. Therefore, assuming for the moment that the capillary vessels can be acted on by close attention, those of the face will have become eminently susceptible. Through the force of association, the same effects will tend to follow whenever we think that others are considering or censuring our actions or character. As the basis of this theory rests on mental attention having some power to influence the capillary circulation, it will be necessary to give a considerable body of details, bearing more or less directly on this subject. Several observers, who from their wide experience and knowledge are eminently capable of forming a sound judgment, are convinced that attention or consciousness which latter term Sir H. Holland thinks the more explicit, concentrated on almost any part of the body, produces some direct physical effect on it. This applies to the movement of the involuntary muscles and of the voluntary muscles when acting involuntarily, to the secretion of the glands, to the activity of the senses and sensations, and even to the nutrition of parts. It is known that the involuntary movements of the heart are affected if close attention be paid to them. Graciolet gives the case of a man who, by continually watching and counting his own pulse, at last caused one beat out of every six to intermit. On the other hand, my father told me of a careful observer who certainly had heart disease and died from it, and who positively stated that his pulse was habitually irregular to an extreme degree. Yet to his great disappointment, it invariably became regular as soon as my father entered the room. Sir H. Holland remarks that the effect upon the circulation of a part from the consciousness suddenly directed and fixed upon it is often obvious and immediate. Professor Laycock who has particularly attended to phenomena of this nature, insists that when the attention is directed to any portion of the body, innervation and circulation are excited locally, and the functional activity of that portion developed. It is generally believed that the peristaltic movements of the intestines are influenced by attention being paid to them at fixed recurrent periods. And these movements depend on the contraction of unstripped and involuntary muscles. The abnormal action of the voluntary muscles in epilepsy, chorea, and hysteria is known to be influenced by the expectation of an attack and by the sight of other patients similarly affected. So it is with the involuntary acts of yawning and laughing. Certain glands are much influenced by thinking of them or of the conditions under which they have been habitually excited. This is familiar to everyone in the increased flow of saliva, when the thought, for instance, of intensely acid fruit is kept before the mind. It was shown in our sixth chapter that an earnest and long-continued desire either to repress or to increase the action of the lacrimal glands is effectual. Some curious cases have been recorded in the case of women of the power of the mind on the mammary glands, and still more remarkable ones in relation to the uterine functions. 
See Glaciolet on the subject, De la Fise, page 287. Dr. J. Crichton Brown, from his observations on the insane, is convinced that attention directed for a prolonged period on any part or organ may ultimately influence its capillary circulation and nutrition. He has given me some extraordinary cases. One of these, which cannot here be related in full, refers to a married woman 50 years of age who labored under the firm and long-continued delusion that she was pregnant. When the expected period arrived, she acted precisely as if she had been really delivered of a child and seemed to suffer extreme pain so that the perspiration broke out on her forehead. The result was that a state of things returned, continuing for three days, which had ceased during the six previous years. Mr. Braid gives, in his Magic, Hypnotism, and etc., 1852, page 95, and in his other works, analogous cases, as well as other facts showing the great influence of the will on the mammary glands, even on one breast alone. When we direct our whole attention to any one sense, its acuteness is increased. And the continued habit of close attention, as with blind people to that of hearing, and with the blind and deaf to that of touch, appears to improve the sense in question permanently. There is also some reason to believe, judging from the capacities of different races of man, that the effects are inherited. Turning to ordinary sensations, it is well known that pain is increased by attending to it. And Sir B. Brodie goes so far as to believe that pain may be felt in any part of the body to which attention is closely drawn. Sir H. Holland also remarks that we become not only conscious of the existence of a part subjected to concentrated attention, but we experience in it various odd sensations as of weight, heat, cold, tingling, or itching. Lastly, some physiologists maintain that the mind can influence the nutrition of parts. Sir J. Paget has given a curious instance of the power, not indeed of the mind, but of the nervous system, on the hair. A lady, who is subject to attacks of what is called nervous headache, always finds in the morning after such a one that some patches of her hair are white, as if powdered with starch. The change is effected in a night, and in a few days after, the hairs gradually regain their dark brownish color. We thus see that close attention certainly affects various parts and organs, which are not properly under the control of the will. By what means attention, perhaps the most wonderful of all the wondrous powers of the mind, is affected, is an extremely obscure subject. According to Muller, the process by which the sensory selves of the brain are rendered, through the will, susceptible of receiving more intense and distinct impressions, is closely analogous to that by which the motor cells are excited to send nerve force to the voluntary muscles. There are many points of analogy in the action of the sensory and motor nerve cells. For instance, the familiar fact that close attention to any one sense causes fatigue like the prolonged exertion of any one muscle. When therefore we voluntarily concentrate our attention on any part of the body, the cells of the brain which receive impressions or sensations from that part are, it is probable, in some unknown manner stimulated into activity. This may account, without any local change in the part to which our attention is earnestly directed, for pain or odd sensations being there felt or increased. If, however, the part is furnished with muscles, we cannot feel sure, as Mr. Michael Foster has remarked to me that some slight impulse may not be unconsciously sent to such muscles, and this would probably cause an obscure sensation in the part. In a large number of cases, as with the salivary and lacrimal glands, intestinal canal, and etc., the power of attention seems to rest either chiefly, or as some physiologists think, 
exclusively on the vasomotor system being affected in such a manner that more blood is allowed to flow into the capillaries of the part in question this increased action of the capillaries may in some cases be combined with the simultaneously increased activity of the sensorium the manner in which the mind affects the vasomotor system may be conceived in the following manner when we actually taste sour fruit an impression is sent through the gustatory nerves to a certain part of the sensorium this transmits nerve force to the vasomotor centre which consequently allows the muscular coats of the small arteries that permeate the salivary glands to relax hence more blood flows into these glands and they secrete a copious supply of saliva now it does not seem an improbable assumption that when we reflect intently on a sensation the same part of the sensorium or a closely connected part of it is brought into a state of activity in the same manner as when we actually perceive the sensation if so the same cells in the brain will be excited though perhaps in a less degree by vividly thinking about a sour taste as by perceiving it and they will transmit in the one case as in the other nerve force to the vasomotor center with the same results to give another and in some respects more appropriate illustration if a man stands before a hot fire his face reddens this appears to be due as mr michael foster informs me in part to the loco action of the heat and in part to a reflex action from the vasomotor centers in this latter case the heat affects the nerves of the face these transmit an impression to the sensory cells of the brain which act on the vasomotor center and this reacts on the small arteries of the face relaxing them and allowing them to become filled with blood here again it seems not improbable that if we were repeatedly to concentrate with great earnestness our attention on the recollection of our heated faces the same part of the sensorium which give us the consciousness of actual heat would be in some slight degree stimulated and would in consequence tend to transmit some nerve force to the vasomotor centers so as to relax the capillaries of the face now as men during endless generations have had their attention often and earnestly directed to their personal appearance and especially to their faces any incipient tendency in the facial capillaries to be thus affected will have become in the course of time greatly strengthened through the principles just referred to namely nerve force passing readily along accustomed channels and inherited habit thus as it appears to me a plausible explanation is afforded of the leading phenomena connected with the act of blushing recapitulation men and women and especially the young have always valued in a high degree their personal appearance and have likewise regarded the appearance of others the face has been the chief object of attention though when men aboriginally when naked the whole surface of his body would have been attended to our self-attention is excited almost exclusively by the opinion of others for no person living in absolute solitude would care about his appearance every one feels blame more acutely than praise now whenever we know or suppose that others are depreciating our personal appearance our attention is strongly drawn towards ourselves more especially to our faces the probable effect of this will be as has just been explained to excite into activity that part of the sensorium which receives the sensory nerves of the face and this will react through the vasomotor system on the facial capillaries by frequent reiteration during numberless generations the process will have become so habitual in association with the belief that others are thinking of us that even a suspicion of their depreciation suffices to relax the capillaries without any conscious thought about our faces with some sensitive persons it is enough even to notice their dress to produce the same effect through the forest also of association and inheritance our capillaries are relaxed whenever we know or imagine that any one is blaming though in silence our actions 
thoughts, or character, and again when we are highly praised. On this hypothesis, we can understand how it is that the face blushes much more than any other part of the body, though the whole surface is somewhat affected, more especially with the races, which still go nearly naked. It is not at all surprising that the dark-colored races should blush, though no change of color is visible in their skins. From the principle of inheritance, it is not surprising that persons born blind should blush. We can understand why the young are much more affected than the old, and women more than men, and why the opposite sexes especially excite each other's blushes. It becomes obvious why personal remarks should be particularly liable to cause blushing and why the most powerful of all the causes is shyness. For shyness relates to the presence and opinion of others, and the shy are always more or less self-conscious. With respect to real shame for moral delinquencies, we can perceive why it is not guilt, but the thought that others think us guilty, which raises a blush. A man reflecting on a crime committed in solitude and stung by his conscience does not blush, yet he will blush under the vivid recollection of a detected fault or of one committed in the presence of others, the degree of blushing being closely related to the feeling of regard for those who have detected, witnessed, or suspected his fault. Breaches of conventional rules of conduct, if they are rigidly insisted on by our equals or superiors, often cause more intense blushes even than a detected crime. And an act which is really criminal, if not blamed by our equals, hardly raises a tinge of color on our cheeks. Modesty from humility, or from an indelicacy, excites a vivid blush, as both relate to the judgment or fixed customs of others. From the intimate sympathy which exists between the capillary circulation of the surface of the head and of the brain, whenever there is intense blushing, there will be some, and often great, confusion of mind. This is frequently accompanied by awkward movements, and sometimes by the involuntary twitching of certain muscles. As blushing, according to this hypothesis, is an indirect result of attention, originally directed to our personal appearance, that is to the surface of the body, and more especially to the face, we can understand the meaning of the gestures which accompany blushing throughout the world. These consist in hiding the face, or turning it toward the ground, or to one side. The eyes are generally averted, or are restless, for to look at the man who causes us to feel shame or shyness immediately brings home in intolerable manner the consciousness that his gaze is directed on us. Through the principle of associated habit, the same movements of the face and eyes are practiced, and can, indeed, hardly be avoided, whenever we know or believe that others are blaming, or too strongly praising, our moral conduct. End of section 25 Section 26 of the expression of the emotions in man and animals. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 14, Concluding Remarks and Summary, Part 1. The three leading principles which have determined the chief movements of expression, their inheritance, on the part which the will and the intention have played in the acquirement of various expressions, the instinctive recognition of expression, the bearing of our subject on the specific unity of the races of man, on the successive acquirement of various expressions by the progenitors of man, the importance of expression, conclusion. I have now described, to the best of my ability, the chief expressive actions in man, and in some few of the lower animals. I have also attempted to explain the origin or development of these actions through the three principles given in the first chapter. The first of these principles is that movements which are serviceable in gratifying some desire or in relieving some sensation, if often repeated, become so habitual that they are performed, whether or not of any service, whenever the same desire or sensation is felt, even in a very weak degree. Our second principle is that of antithesis. 
the habit of voluntarily performing opposite movements under opposite impulses has become firmly established in us by the practice of our whole lives. Hence, if certain actions have been regularly performed, in accordance with our first principle, under a certain frame of mind, there will be a strong and involuntary tendency to the performance of directly opposite actions, whether or not these are of any use, under the excitement of an opposite frame of mind. Our third principle is the direct action of the excited nervous system on the body, independently of the will, and independently in large part of habit. Experience shows that nerve force is generated and set free whenever the cerebrospinal system is excited. The direction which this nerve force follows is necessarily determined by the lines of connection between the nerve cells, with each other and with various parts of the body. But the direction is likewise much influenced by habit, inasmuch as nerve force passes readily along accustomed channels. The frantic and senseless actions of an enraged man may be attributed in part to the undirected flow of nerve force, and in part to the effects of habit, for these actions often vaguely represent the act of striking. They thus pass into gestures included under our first principle, as when an indignant man unconsciously throws himself into a fitting attitude for attacking his opponent, though without any intention of making an actual attack. We also see the influence of habit in all the emotions and sensations which are called exciting, for they have assumed this character from having habitually led to energetic action, and action affects, in an indirect manner, the respiratory and circulatory system, and the latter reacts on the brain. Whenever these emotions or sensations are even slightly felt by us, though they may not at the time lead to any exertion, our whole system is nevertheless disturbed through the force of habit and association. Other emotions and sensations are called depressing, because they have not habitually led to energetic action, excepting just at first, as in the case of extreme pain, fear, and grief, and they have ultimately caused complete exhaustion. They are consequently expressed chiefly by negative signs and by prostration. Again, there are other emotions, such as that of affection, which do not commonly lead to action of any kind, and consequently are not exhibited by any strongly marked outward signs. Affection, indeed, in as far as it is a pleasurable sensation, excites the ordinary signs of pleasure. On the other hand, many of the effects due to the excitement of the nervous system seem to be quite independent of the flow of nerve force along the channels which have been rendered habitual by former exertions of the will. Such effects, which often reveal the state of mind of the persons thus affected, cannot at present be explained. For instance, the change of color in the hair from extreme terror or grief, the cold sweat and trembling of the muscles from fear, the modified secretions of the intestinal canal, and the failure of certain glands to act. Notwithstanding that much remains unintelligible in our present subject, so many expressive movements and actions can be explained to a certain extent through the above three principles, that we may hope hereafter to see all explained by these or by closely analogous principles. Actions of all kinds, if regularly accompanying any state of mind, are at once recognized as expressive. These may consist of movements of any part of the body, as the wagging of a dog's tail, the shrugging of a man's shoulders, the erection of the hair the exudation of perspiration, the state of capillary circulation, labored breathing, and the use of vocal or other sound-producing instruments. Even insects express anger, terror, jealousy, and love by their stridulation. With man the respiratory organs are of especial importance in expression, not only in a direct, but in a still higher degree in an indirect manner. Few points are more interesting in our present subject than the extraordinarily complex chain of events which lead to certain expressive movements. Take, for instance, the oblique eyebrows of a man suffering from grief or anxiety. When infants scream loudly from hunger or pain, the circulation is affected, and the eyes tend to become gorged with blood. Consequently, the muscles surrounding the eyes are strongly contracted as a protection. This action, in the course of many generations, has become firmly fixed and inherited, but when, with advancing years and culture, the habit of screaming is partially repressed, the muscles round the eyes still tend to contract whenever even slight distress is felt. Of these muscles, the pyramidals of the nose are less under the control of the will than are the others, and their contraction can be checked only by that of the central fasciae of the frontal muscle. These latter fasciae draw up the inner ends of the eyebrows and wrinkle the forehead in a peculiar manner, which we instantly recognize as the expression of grief or anxiety. Slight movements, such as these just described, or the scarcely perceptible drawing down of the corners of the mouth, are the last remnants or rudiments of strongly marked and intelligible movements. They are as full of significance to us in regard to expression as are ordinary rudiments to the naturalist in the classification and genealogy of organic beings. 
That the chief expressive actions exhibited by man and by the lower animals are now innate or inherited, that is, have not been learnt by the individual, is admitted by every one. So little has learning or imitation to do with several of them, that they are from the earliest days and throughout life quite beyond our control. For instance, the relaxation of the arteries of the skin and blushing, and the increased action of the heart and anger. We may see children only two or three years old, and even those born blind, blushing from shame, and the naked scalp of a very young infant reddens from passion. Infants scream from pain directly after birth, and all their features then assume the same form as during subsequent years. These facts alone suffice to show that many of our most important expressions have not been learnt, but it is remarkable that some, which are certainly innate, require practice in the individual before they are performed in a full and perfect manner. For instance, weeping and laughing. The inheritance of most of our expressive actions explains the fact that those born blind display them, as I hear from Rev. H. R. Blair, equally well with those gifted with eyesight. We can thus also understand the fact that the young and the old of widely different races, both with man and animals, express the same state of mind by the same movements. We are so familiar with the fact of young and old animals displaying their feelings in the same manner that we hardly perceive how remarkable it is that a young puppy should wag its tail when pleased, depress its ears and uncover its canine teeth when pretending to be savage, just like an old dog, or that a kitten should arch its little back and erect its hair when frightened and angry, like an old cat. When, however, we turn to less common gestures in ourselves, which we are accustomed to look at as artificial or conventional, such as shrugging the shoulders as a sign of impotence, or raising the arms with open hands and extended fingers as a sign of wonder, we feel perhaps too much surprise at finding that they are innate. That these and some other gestures are inherited we may infer from their being performed by very young children, by those born blind, and by the most widely distinct races of man. We should also bear in mind that new and highly peculiar tricks, in association with certain states of the mind, are known to have arisen in certain individuals, and to have been afterwards transmitted to their offspring, in some cases, for more than one generation. Certain other gestures, which seem to us so natural that we might easily imagine that they were innate, apparently have been learnt, like the words of a language. This seems to be the case with the joining of the uplifted hands, and the turning up of the eyes in prayer. So it is with kissing as a mark of affection, but this is innate in so far as it depends on the pleasure derived from contact with a beloved person. The evidence with respect to the inheritance of nodding and shaking the head, as signs of affirmation and negation, is doubtful, for they are not universal, yet seem too general to have been independently acquired by all the individuals of so many races. We will now consider how far the will and consciousness have come to play in the development of the various movements of expression. As far as we can judge, only a few expressive movements, such as those just referred to, are learnt by each individual. That is, were consciously and voluntarily performed during the early years of life for some definite object, or an imitation of others, and then became habitual. The far greater number of the movements of expression, and all the more important ones, are, as we have seen, innate or inherited, and such cannot be said to depend on the will of the individual. Nevertheless, all those included under our principle were at first voluntarily performed for a definite object, namely to escape some danger, to relieve some distress, or to gratify some desire. For instance, there can hardly be a doubt that the animals which fight with their teeth have acquired the habit of drawing back their ears closely to their heads when feeling savage from their progenitors having voluntarily acted in this manner in order to protect their ears from being torn by their antagonists. For those animals which do not fight with their teeth do not thus express a savage state of mind. We may infer as highly probable that we ourselves have acquired the habit of contracting the muscles round the eyes whilst crying gently, that is, without the utterance of any loud sound, from our progenitors, especially during infancy, having experienced during the act of screaming an uncomfortable sensation in their eyeballs. Again, some highly expressive movements result from the endeavor to check or prevent other expressive movements. Thus the obliquity of the eyebrows and the drawing down of the corners of the mouth follow from the endeavor to prevent a screaming fit from coming on, or to check it after it has come on. Here it is obvious that the consciousness and will must at first have come into play. Not that we are conscious in these or in other such cases what muscles are brought into action, any more than when we perform the most ordinary voluntary movements. With respect to the expressive movements due to the principle of antithesis, it is clear that the will has intervened though in a remote and indirect manner. So again with the movements coming under our third principle. These, in as far as they are influenced by nerve force readily passing through the habitual channels, have been determined by former and repeated exertions of the will. The effects indirectly due to this latter agency are often combined in a complex manner. 
through the force of habit and association with those directly resulting from the excitement of the cerebrospinal system. This seems to be the case with the increased action of the heart under the influence of any strong emotion. When an animal erects its hair, assumes a threatening attitude, and utters fierce sounds in order to terrify an enemy, we see a curious combination of movements which were originally voluntary with those that are involuntary. It is, however, possible that even strictly involuntary actions, such as the erection of the hair, may have been affected by the mysterious power of the will. Some expressive movements may have arisen spontaneously in association with certain states of mind, like the tricks lately referred to and afterwards been inherited. But I know of no evidence rendering this view probable. The power of communication between the members of the same tribe by means of language has been of paramount importance in the development of man, and the force of language is much aided by the expressive movements of the face and body. We perceive this at once when we converse on an important subject with any person whose face is concealed. Nevertheless, there are no grounds, as far as I can discover, for believing that any muscle has been developed or even modified exclusively for the sake of expression. The vocal and other sound-producing organs, by which various expressive noises are produced, seem to form a partial exception, but I have elsewhere attempted to show that these organs were first developed for sexual purposes, in order that one sex might call or charm the other. Nor can I discover grounds for believing that any inherited movement, which now serves as a means of expression, was at first voluntary and consciously performed for this special purpose, like some of the gestures and the finger language used by the deaf and dumb. On the contrary, every true or inherited movement of expression seems to have had some natural and independent origin. But when once acquired, such movements may be voluntarily and consciously employed as a means of communication. Even infants, if carefully attended to, find out at a very early age that their screaming brings relief, and they soon voluntarily practice it. We may frequently see a person voluntarily raising his eyebrows to express surprise, or smiling to express pretended satisfaction and acquiescence. A man often wishes to make certain gestures conspicuous or demonstrative, and will raise his extended arms with widely open fingers above his head to show astonishment, or lift his shoulders to his ears to show that he cannot or will not do something. The tendency to such movements will be strengthened or increased by their being thus voluntarily and repeatedly performed, and the effects may be inherited. It is perhaps worth consideration whether movements at first used only by one or a few individuals to express a certain state of mind may not sometimes have spread to others, and ultimately have become universal, through the power of conscious and unconscious imitation. That there exists in man a strong tendency to imitation, independently of the conscious will, is certain. This is exhibited in the most extraordinary manner in certain brain diseases, especially at the commencement of inflammatory softening of the brain, and has been called the echo sign. Patients thus affected imitate, without understanding, every absurd gesture which is made and every word which is uttered near them, even in a foreign language. In the case of animals, the jackal and wolf have learnt under confinement to imitate the barking of the dog. How the barking of the dog, which serves to express various emotions and desires, and which is so remarkable from having been acquired since the animal was domesticated, and from being inherited in different degrees by different breeds, was first learnt, we do not know. But may we not suspect that imitation has had something to do with its acquisition, owing to dogs having long lived in strict association with so loquacious an animal as man? End of section 26「Section 27 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin. Chapter 14, Concluding Remarks and Summary, Part 2. In the course of the foregoing remarks and throughout this volume, I have often felt much difficulty about the proper application of the terms will, consciousness, and intention. Actions, which were at first voluntary, soon became habit, and at last hereditary, and may then be performed even in opposition to the will. Although they often reveal the state of the mind, this result was not at first either intended or expected. Even such words as that certain movements serve as a means of expression are apt to mislead, as they imply that this was their primary purpose or object. This, however, seems rarely or never to have been the case, the movements having been at first either of some direct use or the indirect effect of the excited state of the sensorium. An infant may scream either intentionally or instinctively to show that it wants food, but it has no wish or intention to draw its features into the peculiar form which so plainly indicates misery. 
yet some of the most characteristic expressions exhibited by man are derived from the act of screaming, as has been explained. Although most of our expressive actions are innate or instinctive, as is admitted by everyone, it is a different question whether we have any instinctive power of recognizing them. This has generally been assumed to be the case, but the assumption has been strongly controverted by M. Lemoine. Monkeys soon learn to distinguish not only the tones of voice of their masters, but the expression of their faces, as is asserted by a careful observer. Dogs well know the difference between caressing and threatening gestures or tones, and they seem to recognize a compassionate tone. But as far as I can make out, after repeated trials, they do not understand any movement confined to the features, excepting a smile or laugh. In this they appear, at least in some cases, to recognize. This limited amount of knowledge has probably been gained, both by monkeys and dogs, through their associating harsh or kind treatment with our actions, and the knowledge certainly is not instinctive. Children, no doubt, would soon learn the movements of expression in their elders in the same manner as animals learn those of man. Moreover, when a child cries or laughs, he knows in a general manner what he is doing and what he feels, so that a very small exertion of reason would tell him what crying or laughing meant in others. But the question is, do our children acquire their knowledge of expression solely by experience through the power of association and reason? As most of the movements of expression must have been gradually acquired afterwards becoming instinctive, there seems to be some degree of a priori probability that their recognition would likewise have become instinctive. There is at least no greater difficulty in believing this than in admitting that, when a female quadruped first bears young, she knows the cry of distress of her offspring, or than in admitting that many animals instinctively recognize and fear their enemies. And of both of these statements there can be no reasonable doubt. It is, however, extremely difficult to prove that our children instinctively recognize any expression. I attended to this point in my first-born infant, who could not have learned anything by associating with other children, and I was convinced that he understood a smile and received pleasure from seeing me, answering it by another, at much too early an age to have learnt anything by experience. When this child was about four months old, I made in his presence many odd noises and strange grimaces, and tried to look savage. But the noises, if not too loud, as well as the grimaces, were all taken as good jokes, and I attributed this at the time to their being preceded or accompanied by smiles. When five months old, he seemed to understand a compassionate expression and tone of voice. When a few days over six months, his nurse pretended to cry, and I saw that his face instantly assumed a melancholy expression, with corners of the mouth strongly depressed. Now this child could rarely have seen any other children crying, and never a grown-up person crying, and I should doubt whether at so early an age he could have reasoned on the subject. Therefore it seems to me that an innate feeling must have told him that the pretended crying of his nurse expressed grief. In this, through the instinct of sympathy, excited grief in him." M. Lemoine argues that, if man possessed an innate knowledge of expression, authors and artists would not have found it so difficult, as is notoriously the case, to describe and depict the characteristic signs of each particular state of mind. But this does not seem to me a valid argument. We may actually behold the expression changing in an unmistakable manner in a man or animal, and yet be quite unable, as I know from experience, to analyze the nature of the change. In the two photographs given by Duchenne of the same old man, Almost everyone recognized that the one represented a true and the other a false smile, but I have found it very difficult to decide in what the whole manner of difference consists. It has often struck me as a curious fact that so many shades of expression are instantly recognized without any conscious process of analysis on our part. No one, I believe, can clearly describe a sullen or sly expression, yet many observers are unanimous that these expressions can be recognized in the various races of man. Almost every one to whom I showed Duchenne's photograph of the young man with oblique eyebrows at once declared that it expressed grief or some such feeling. Yet probably not one of these persons, or one out of a thousand persons, could beforehand have told anything precise about the obliquity of the eyebrows, with their inner ends puckered, or about the rectangular furrows on the forehead. So it is with many expressions, of which I have had practical experience in the trouble requisite in instructing others what points to observe. If, then, great ignorance of details does not prevent our recognizing with certainty and promptitude various expressions, I do not see how this ignorance can be advanced as an argument that our knowledge, though vague and general, is not innate. I have endeavored to show in considerable detail that all the chief expressions exhibited by man are the same throughout the world. This fact is interesting, as it affords a new argument in favor of the several races being descended from a single parent stock, which must have been almost completely human in structure and to a large extent in mind, before the period at which the races diverged from each other, 
no doubt similar structures, adapted for the same purpose, have often been independently acquired through variation and natural selection by distinct species, but this view will not explain close similarity between distinct species in a multitude of unimportant details. Now, if we bear in mind the numerous points of structure having no relation to expression, in which all the races of man closely agree, and then add to them the numerous points, some of the highest importance, and many of the most trifling value, on which the movements of expression, directly or indirectly, depend, it seems to me improbable in the highest degree that so much similarity, or rather identity of structure, could have been acquired by independent means. Yet this must have been the case if the races of man are descended from several aboriginally distinct species. It is far more probable that the many points of close similarity in the various races are due to inheritance from a single parent form, which had already assumed a human character. It is a curious, though perhaps an idle speculation, how early in the long line of our progenitors the various expressive movements now exhibited by man were successively acquired. The following remarks will at least serve to recall some of the chief points discussed in this volume. We may confidently believe that laughter, as a sign of pleasure or enjoyment, was practiced by our progenitors long before they deserved to be called human. For many kinds of monkeys, when pleased, utter a reiterated sound, clearly analogous to our laughter, often accompanied by vibratory movements of their jaws or lips, with the corners of the mouth drawn backwards and upwards, by the wrinkling of the cheeks, and even the brightening of the eyes. We may likewise infer that fear was expressed from an extremely remote period in almost the same manner as it is now by man by trembling, the erection of the hair, cold perspiration, pallor, widely opened eyes, the relaxation of most of the muscles, and by the whole body cowering downwards or held motionless. Suffering, if great, will from the first have caused screams or groans to be uttered, the body to be contorted, and the teeth to be ground together. But our progenitors will not have exhibited those highly expressive movements of the features which accompany screaming and crying until their circulatory and respiratory organs, and the muscles surrounding their eyes, had acquired their present structure. The shedding of tears appears to have originated through reflex action from the spasmodic contraction of the eyelids, together perhaps with the eyeballs becoming gorged with blood during the act of screaming. Therefore weeping probably came on rather late in the line of our descent, and this conclusion agrees with the fact that our nearest allies, the anthropomorphous apes, do not weep. But we must here exercise some caution, for as certain monkeys, which are not closely related to man, weep, this habit might have been developed long ago in a sub-branch of the group from which man is derived. Our early progenitors, when suffering from grief or anxiety, would not have made their eyebrows oblique or have drawn down the corners of their mouth until they had acquired the habit of endeavoring to restrain their screams. The expression, therefore, of grief and anxiety is eminently human. Rage will have been expressed at a very early period by threatening or frantic gestures, by the reddening of the skin, and by glaring eyes, but not by frowning. For the habit of frowning seems to have been acquired chiefly from the corrugators being the first muscles to contract round the eyes, whenever, during infancy, pain, anger, or distress is felt, and there consequently is a near approach to screaming, and partly from a frown serving as a shade in difficult and intent vision. It seems probable that this shading action would not have become habitual until man had assumed a completely upright position, for monkeys do not frown when exposed to a glaring light. Our early progenitors, when enraged, would probably have exposed their teeth more freely than does man, even when giving full vent to his rage, as with the insane. We may, also, feel almost certain that they would have protruded their lips when sulky or disappointed, in a greater degree than is the case with our own children, or even with the children of existing savage races. Our early progenitors, when indignant or moderately angry, would not have held their hands erect, opened their chests, squared their shoulders, and clenched their fists, until they had acquired the ordinary carriage and upright attitude of man, and had learned to fight with their fists or clubs. Until this period had arrived, the antithetical gesture of shrugging the shoulders as a sign of impotence or of patience would not have been developed. From the same reason, astonishment would not then have been expressed by the raising of the arms with open hands and extended fingers nor, judging from the actions of monkeys, would astonishment have been exhibited by a widely opened mouth. But the eyes would have been opened and the eyebrows arched. Disgust would have been shown at a very early period by movements round the mouth, like those of vomiting. That is, if the view which I have suggested respecting the source of the expression is correct, namely that our progenitors had the power, and used it, of voluntarily and quickly rejecting any food from their stomachs which they disliked. But the more refined manner of showing contempt or disdain, by lowering the eyelids, or turning away the eyes and face, as if the despised person were not worth looking at, would not probably have been acquired until a much later period. Of all expressions, blushing seems to be the most strictly human, yet it is common to all or nearly all the races of man, 
whether or not any change of color is visible on their skin. The relaxation of the small arteries of the surface, on which blushing depends, seem to have primarily resulted from earnest attention directed to the appearance of our own persons, especially of our faces, aided by habit, inheritance, and the ready flow of nerve force along accustomed channels, and afterwards to have been extended by the power of association, to self-attention directed to moral conduct. It can hardly be doubted that many animals are capable of appreciating beautiful colors and even forms, as is shown by the pains which the individuals of one sex take in displaying their beauty before those of the opposite sex. But it does not seem possible that any animal, until its mental powers have been developed to an equal or nearly equal degree with those of man, would have closely considered and been sensitive about its own personal appearance. Therefore we may conclude that blushing originated in a very late period, in the long line of our descent. From the various facts just alluded to, and given in the course of this volume, it follows that, if the structure of our organs of respiration and circulation had differed only in a slight degree from the state in which they now exist, most of our expressions would have been wonderfully different. A very slight change in the course of the arteries and veins which run to the head would probably have prevented the blood from accumulating in our eyeballs during violent expiration, for this occurs in extremely few quadrupeds. In this case we should not have displayed some of our most characteristic expressions. If man had breathed water by the aid of external branchiae, although the idea is hardly conceivable, instead of air through his mouth and nostrils, his features would not have expressed his feelings much more efficiently than now do his hands or limbs. Rage and disgust, however, would still have been shown by movements about the lips and mouth, and the eyes would have become brighter or duller according to the state of the circulation. If our ears had remained movable, their movements would have been slightly expressive, as is the case with all the animals which fight with their teeth and we may infer that our early progenitors thus fought, and we still uncover the canine tooth on one side when we sneer at or defy any one, and we uncover all our teeth when furiously enraged. The movements of expression in the face and body, whatever their origin may have been, are in themselves of much importance for our welfare. They serve as the first means of communication between the mother and her infant. She smiles approval and thus encourages her child on the right path, or frowns disapproval. We readily perceive sympathy in others by their expression. Our sufferings are thus mitigated and our pleasures increased, and mutual good feeling is thus strengthened. The movements of expression give vividness and energy to our spoken words. They reveal the thoughts and intentions of others more truly than do words, which may be falsified. Whatever amount of truth the so-called science of physiognomy may contain appears to depend, as Haller long ago remarked, on different persons bringing into frequent use different facial muscles, according to their dispositions, the development of these muscles being perhaps thus increased, and the lines or furrows on the face, due to their habitual contraction, being thus rendered deeper and more conspicuous. The free expression by outward signs of an emotion intensifies it. On the other hand, the repression, as far as this is possible, of all outward signs, softens our emotions. He who gives way to violent gestures will increase his rage. He who does not control the signs of fear will experience fear in a greater degree, and he who remains passive when overwhelmed with grief loses his best chance at recovering elasticity of mind. These results follow partly from the intimate relation which exists between almost all the emotions and their outward manifestations, and partly from the direct influence of exertion on the heart, and consequently on the brain. Even the simulation of an emotion tends to arouse it in our minds. Shakespeare, who from his wonderful knowledge of the human mind ought to be an excellent judge, says, is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit, that from her working all his visage wanned? Tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. Hamlet, Act Two, Scene Two. We have seen that the study of theory of expression confirms to a certain limited extent the conclusion that man is derived from some lower animal form, and supports the belief of the specific or subspecific unity of the several races, but as far as my judgment serves, such confirmation was hardly needed. We have also seen that the expression in itself, or the language of the emotions, as it has sometimes been called, is certainly of importance for the welfare of mankind. To understand as far as possible the source or origin of the various expressions, which may be hourly seen on the faces of the men around us, not to mention our domesticated animals, ought to possess much interest for us. From these several causes we may conclude that the philosophy of our subject has well deserved the attention which it has already received from several excellent observers, and that it deserves still further attention, especially from any able physiologist. End of section 27
End of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals by Charles Darwin.